Tradoon. Tradoon. Tradune.
And it's therefore likely that we're here today because by the luck of the draw, dinosaurs who had been dominant over mammals in ordinary times got felled in a mass extinction. The Novasari, Paleo Yes No, Paleo He, Paleo Apato 1, Paleo Apato 2, Paleo Apato 3, Paleo Apato 4, Adam GR3 Yes, Adam GR3 NOVETHIS.
Hello. Without a doubt, he came here today to learn about the most extraordinary group of animals that have ever appeared on this planet, the dinosaurs. But today, in contrast to those magnificent beasts, the creature we will be examining is admittedly less impressive, even puny in stature, and less than two meters tall. It is a paleontologist. Normally, it is Lucy, but now, using the latest in streaming technology, we can see for ourselves. Shall we? Feeding almost entirely on plants, it has no sharp claws or fearsome teeth. Being so preoccupied with the study of ancient life, the fossil scientist seems to exist only to dig up, examine, and discuss fossils. Although many of his current Asher and retrusive hours here has learned to communicate over vast distances, broadcasting his strange sounds far and wide. Ankylosaurus and Triceratops, Tyrannosaurus Rex. It is indeed true in human face bone, birds are done. His bizarre display is fascinating to watch. Creatures like this are quite rare, requiring very specific conditions to survive. Oh, Thanks for the hydrate. Welcome to Paleontology. So that it does not die out like the fossil organisms which it studies, we must work to protect this rare and curious creature from extinction. Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Paleontologizing. It is so good to have you here. Happy Monday. I hope you had a wonderful weekend. And, uh, got that light on there. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, we've got a special stream planned. A very rare stream. A video game stream. We're going to be playing Dinosaur Fossil Hunter today. Which, uh... Oh, man. You you just might fall in love with this game. It's very charming. It's a paleontology simulator. A dinosaur paleontology simulator. Although I've also heard rumors that they've added... A new non-dinosaurian creature to the game as well. Anyway, where did my transitions go? That's bizarre. OBS crashed the other day, and now my transitions are are gone. These to be nice and smooth. I don't know why that reset. That's bizarre. Um, and hello, hello, Moon Pie. Hey, what? You want to come up and say hello while we're doing some greetings? Come here. Come on up, Moon Pie. Uh, for those of you who might be new here, welcome to Paleontologizing. My name is Danny Anduza, and I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach, and right now I'm being joined by one of my feline overseers here. This is Moon Pie, everybody. Moon Pie, how are you doing? She's come to, uh, to do her inspections, make her rounds. Yeah, you're the boss around here, aren't you? One of them, anyway. Yeah, Moon Pie's one of the captains in the organization. Um, let's come over to make sure that everything's, uh, everything's running smoothly. You know? <laughs> huh, Moon Pie? Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, Moon Pie. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, uh, as a paleontologist, uh, I study fossils. A paleontologist is a fossil scientist. Of course, not to be confused with an archaeologist. In case you didn't know, archaeologists study human artifacts, remnants of human civilizations. Paleontologists, well, we study fossils. We dig in rock, while archaeologists dig in soil or, or in basements or you know, stuff like that. Huh. Yeah. And... 
Most paleontologists do not study dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are really the tip of the iceberg. I do, though, so I guess I'm not helping with that stereotype, but I am a dinosaur paleontologist, as you can probably guess. Looking at my office here. But as a dinosaur paleontologist, I study dinosaurs, I publish on dinosaurs in the scientific literature, and I dig up dinosaurs during the summer. Don't I, Moonpie? You're gonna miss me this summer when I'm gone, huh? Yeah. It'd be like a whole two or three months, maybe. It could be as much as like May through, uh, through mid-August this year I could be gone. Could be even longer, who knows. But uh, I, <laughs> I plan on live streaming it again, like I did last summer. Uh, you should check out the YouTube page if you want to see the recordings of our Twitch broadcast from the field last year. We were digging in Utah and Wyoming, digging up at least three new species of dinosaur. Um, in the late Cretaceous Almond Formation of Wyoming, very obscure and an increasingly less obscure formation in eastern Utah, the Cedar Mountain Formation. The very, very beginning of the Cretaceous period. The dawn of the Cretaceous. Cedar Mountain Formation, of course, home to such famous dinosaurs as Gastonia and Utah Raptor. We were actually digging in strata even older than those two. Uh, the very, very, very beginning of the Cedar Mountain Formation. The very, very beginning of, uh, of the Cretaceous. So yeah, yeah. And uh, paleontologists, yeah, yeah, North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, they also dig in the Cedar Mountain a lot. That's Lindsay Zano's team. Um, I wasn't digging with Lindsay Zano. I was digging with, uh, with Don DeBlue and Jim Kirkland of the Utah Geological Survey. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's, uh, it's really good to have you all here today. And what is up with our, that's so bizarre. Here, let me... Give me a second here, and I'll see if I can fix this, because this is not the way it's supposed to be right now. Um, settings. Team general. Um, how do I set transitions in OBS? Um, Fade in and out. That should be the default, and OBS crashed the other day, and... Yeah. Um... It crashed, and then it came back, and then... I'm not sure why it's doing this now. Sorry, everybody, but it... Nope, that's not right. Oh, well, maybe it is. Cut. No, we want... Fade. There we go. We got it. We got it. All right, we can get back to business. Yeah. I can see that my uh, 50,000 a year has been well spent. Here you go. There we go. Dinosaur Dave, thank you, thank you for the 28 months of support. Thank you, thank you for that, Dinosaur Dave. And how are you? Hope everything's good. It's good to see you. We are going to be playing some Dinosaur Fossil Hunter today, which I'm really excited for. If you're not yet familiar with this game, but if you like watching me on Twitch, if you're interested in dinosaurs, in fossil science, in natural history, or learning in general, I think I think you're gonna like this game. It's um, it's charming. 
As a paleontologist, I am flattered that someone would make a paleontology simulator game where you get to play as a paleontologist. I'm I'm just so tickled that this exists, and uh, it's a good deal of fun. I think you're gonna like it. Yeah, Samus Crossing, or is it Seamus Crossing? Are you from Scotland, Seamus Crossing? I played the prologue slash demo, and it was pretty fun. Awesome. I'm glad you're here. Welcome to Paleontologize. Yeah. Um. Good stuff. Yeah. And wait, Pimpcat was asking about this. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is a 3D printed Pachycephalosaurus skull. Uh, printed life size. I also have Deinonychus. And, uh, of course, Allosaurus here, too. Yeah. Sam Us, like the game character. You lost me there, but thanks for the pronunciation there, Samus Crossing. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, good stuff. Yeah. Um, oh, the dinos National Dinosaur Museum. Oh, very cool, Dinosaur Dave. Well, well, well. Good stuff. That's awesome. Yeah. And Sign Gnome says, Dino Trophy Hunter. No, this is Dinosaur Fossil Hunter. One of the things that I really love about this game is that... They could have easily made it some sort of, like, commerce simulator thing where you go out and you, like, dig up dinosaur fossils and then you sell them to the highest bidder or something like that. That's not how fossil science works. And that's not how this game works either. In this game, you actually have your own little museum. And, um... It's pretty lovely. It's pretty lovely. I think you're gonna like it. Um, let me see if I can find you a trailer for this real quick. They have that part, but let's just find the trailer. There we go. Uh, take a look at this. What my parents think I do? What my <laughs> friends think I do? <laughs> what society thinks I do? What I actually do? <laughs> spin tires for you. Yeah, we try not to spin tires too much in the field, but it happens. Search for fossils. <laughs> Improve useful skills. Yeah. Oh, the drones, that's so funny. We do not have those in real life, but, um... Again, I gotta remind myself that on a certain level, video games are wish fulfillment. You know? It's not gonna be 100% accurate to the real thing, or else it wouldn't necessarily be a compelling game to play. You know? This is really, really cool, though. Learn about dinosaurs. Yeah. Share your museum via Steam Workshop. Very cool. Discover them all. Join yeah. the adventure now. <laughs> Dinosaur Fossil Hunter, Paleontology Simulator, now available on Steam. Yeah, good stuff. This is from Pyramid Games. Uh, their company run out of Poland, I think. And here's the official gameplay trailer. Take a look. Yeah. That's a snazzy looking vehicle. Uh, 
Leo Vincent says, imagine finding complete skeletons every time I know, right? Or imagine using scanning technology like this in the field. Oh, man. That doesn't exist, but, you know, it's a game. It's, it's... Yeah, and rarely have I used explosives in the field. <laughs> yeah. Just need a cast cutter to open up a jacket, and then do fossil prep, and... This is really cool. And hello, hello! Scott Klopfenstein. Or is it Klopfenstein? Welcome, welcome. Klopfenstein and their 19 raiders are about to get flattened by dinosaur content. I was trying to make a young Frankenstein reference. Scott, thank you so much for the, uh, for the raid, and... Welcome to Paleontologizing, and it's great to have you here. Howdy, howdy. Um... How did your stream go? Looks like you were doing some music. What kind of music? That sounds neat. Yeah, and some sim now no. Excellent. I can't say I'm familiar. Some sim no, no. Yeah. Rel Jenkins has rarely used explosives in the field, so not never. Hey, I. That might be a story for another time. But yeah. Anyway, Scott, I really appreciate your raid. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Are oh, you in an ad? I'm sorry to hear that. Shoot. Um, well, well, we'll wait around for a second here for you to get done with that ad, but maybe let's take a look at, uh, what's going on on the wall. In the meantime, like I said, we've got our Pachycephalosaurus skull, Deinonychus skull. Here's a brand new rock hammer. I've never actually used that one in the field. Not yet. And then, uh, Allosaurus, and then some of our images. We've got the Amon H5027 Tyrannosaurus skeleton. We've got... And an AMH dig there. That I think one it's like Utah, but I'm not sure. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, and a few other things. And uh Stunner Alpha says you stream full time? I do. This is actually how I make my living, believe it or not. Um Call me the world's first full time live streaming paleontologist. Uh when I'm not out in the field digging up dinosaurs, which I will be in a few months. I'll be streaming from there. When I'm not out on the field, I'm here in my office. Talking about fossils, talking about natural history, talking about this grand pageant of life on Earth that's been going on for 3.8 billion years. And answering your questions. Trying to bring fossil science to the public in the best way that I know how. Um, and trying to make it fun and engaging and accessible. So... Today we're doing that by, uh, we're going to be playing some Dinosaur Fossil Hunter in a couple minutes here. Um, but yeah, Max Langer is the greatest Brazilian paleontologist. Oh, can't say I'm familiar. Some, some now, now. Does he work on pterosaurs or, um, fossil fishes? Um, there's not too many dinosaurs in Brazil, but that, uh... But that is growing. That field. Anyway. Big Merle says, I've been to a dig site before. They were digging up mammoths in Nebraska. It was kind of cool. Kind of cool. Do you, uh... Do you understate things as a matter of course? Sometimes, Big Merle? <laughs> um, it would be funny if you were actually, like, 30 feet tall. And you're like, yeah, my name is Big Merle. Like, no, you should be huge, Merle. <laughs> Kinda cool. I'm sure it was really, really cool. I did a live stream from the Mammoth site in South Dakota a few years ago, and that was pretty awesome. Um, but that is a world-class site. I don't know. what the Maybe they only had a few bones or something in Nebraska. I could see that being kind of cool, I suppose. But honestly, even more than just a couple fossil bones, that's usually really, really cool. Anyway, I appreciate you being here, Big Merle. How are you doing? Yeah. And Stunner Alpha says, how did you get into paleontology? Uh, should we play a welcome video? Would you appreciate that right off the bat? Because we can do that. Give me a one in the chat if you'd like to see a welcome video. 
to help introduce you to the channel, tell you who I am, how I got into paleontology, what a paleontologist is doing here on Twitch. Um, you would stun her All right, I'm seeing a lot of ones. Well, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our good friend, previously recorded Danny, who is currently sauntering up behind me right here. He's going to tell you, like I said, about how this channel got started, who I am, why a paleontologist is here on Twitch, how I became a paleontologist in the first place, all that good stuff. So, without further ado, thank you again for the raid, Scott Kopfenstein, and uh, previously recorded Danny. Take it away. Thanks, present day Danny. You know, people ask me all the time, Danny, how did you first get interested in paleontology? And I've always been interested in fossils from the earliest time I can remember, particularly dinosaurs. My parents like to say that I decided I wanted to become a paleontologist pretty much the moment I realized I couldn't grow up to be a dinosaur. And believe me, I tried. I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is a lovely place to grow up. Except that we haven't got any dinosaur fossils here. So right after high school, I packed up and moved to Montana, one of the best places in the world to find dinosaurs. And just a couple days after I arrived in Montana, I started working at the lab at Museum of the Rockies and the paleontology program founded by Jack Horner. Jack's done a lot of amazing things in his career, but you may know him as the scientific advisor on the movie Jurassic Park. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the, the guy, Alan Grant, was you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> but we wanted a credible resource that could back up several theories that we were sort of expounding. And one was that dinosaurs eventually evolved into birds. And even the word raptor means bird of prey. And that's something that Jack Horner believes in and could defend if necessary, and Jack Horner became our credibility. It was in this program that Jack built that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist and how to think outside the box. I've done work at a number of other museums around the American West, helping to prep fossils, design exhibits, and educate visitors. I did a fair bit of eclectic field work in various places, identifying and collecting early Cretaceous dinosaur tracks on the Idaho border, Sphenodontian fossils in the gravelly range of the Rocky Mountains, Cenozoic fishes in western Nevada. But most of my work out in the field was with Dr. Denver Fowler, who is now curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. In all, I've worked probably a few hundred sites throughout the late Cretaceous of Montana, in the Hell Creek and Judith River formations, digging up dinosaurs. Lots and lots and lots of dinosaurs. And from time to time, that work has even garnered some media attention. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head, and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. And uh, much like my field work, my research focuses on dinosaurs. I'm particularly interested in their behavioral functional morphology all these bizarre anatomical features that certain dinosaurs had, I want to know what they used them for. Right now, I'm working on a study on spinosaurs. All right, but don't ask me too much about that because it's uh, still a project in the works and I can't give away too much just yet till it's published. But anyway, a couple years ago, I realized that things were definitely headed downhill in Montana. So I packed up and headed back to the West Coast. And I've become kind of fed up with all the bullshit in academia, so uh, I found myself another job. I am now a teacher in early childhood education. And let me tell you, it's been a natural fit since day one. Now, given that I get to design the curriculum, my students now know more about biology, classification, and the history of life on Earth than most adults do. I've been helping raise a new generation of young scientists. Then, coronavirus hit. In mid-March, when all the schools shut down in San Francisco, I started holding classes over Zoom, and we picked up right where we left off. One, two, three. I love digging in the dirt. 
with just a pick and brush. Of finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I see are rare and ancient things, like Velociraptor's jump or Archaeopteryx's wings, and all the kids want to see the lining up at a home museum. I am Hope Paleontologist. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. I am Hope Paleontologist. That's who I am. 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 I realized that I really enjoy teaching remotely, so back in May, I decided to try streaming on Twitch. And here we are. This is my passion, and now I get to share it with you. And what could be cooler than that? I believe that scientists ought to be public servants. Ultimately, it's our job not just to make scientific discoveries, but to teach the public about them. That's exactly what I want to do here. Now, because of COVID-19, this will be my first summer in almost 10 years with no fieldwork. I'm trying to look on the bright side, though. It's not all bad. It, at least I have more time for outreach. And I've got plenty of cool stuff to work on. And if you could throw some support my way by subscribing, I'd be incredibly grateful. So anyway, if you are new here, you should be pretty well clued in by now. And uh, I'm glad you're here. I hope you're having a good time. Anyway, let's uh, see what present day Danny has cooked up for us. All right, present day Danny, back to you. Thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. And of course, thank you even more to Scott Klopfenstein for the raid, for Stunner Alpha for the follow. And... Uh, Nathan Iasaur, for the follow as well. It sounds like you're in the right place. Welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? It's good to have you here. I hope that video explains some things. It is a little bit old. I'm working hard on some new welcome videos like that. They're more up to date. That one was from 2020. I have indeed done a bunch of field work since then. Even live streamed a good portion of it. Almost all of my field work this summer. I live stream, or at least almost every day from the field this summer. What a wonderful outreach opportunity, showing people, not just telling people what it's like to dig up dinosaur fossils, but taking them along for the journey via the magic of Twitch, showing them live how we find and excavate, and to a certain extent, study dinosaurs. That's kind of what today's stream is about, but through the lens of a video game. Dinosaur Fossil Hunter. We're going to be exploring here. So, Leo Vincent says, dude, you should have your own show on TV. I appreciate that, Leo Vincent. I <laughs> thank you for the kind words. I appreciate that. Maybe someday. But for now, we've got this here on Twitch. Yeah. Rachel Darling Endeavor says, I'm happy Danny is live here so that he can answer questions. That's what I'm going to be doing a lot of tonight as we, uh, as we get into this game. Again, if any of you just got here, we're going to be taking a look at Dinosaur Fossil Hunter today and checking out some of their new content here. Uh, take a look. Uh, this is a great game. It's the only game that I've seen that really tries to capture the the wonder and the sense of discovery inherent to uh, to dinosaur paleontology. Even if it's a little fanciful at times, you know, it's it's a video game. It's wish fulfillment. The real thing can be a lot more tedious, but and difficult. This this is just fun. Oh, man. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, 
And I'm glad you're here for it today. What do you say we jump in? Uh, before we do, check this out. I had no idea they were going to do this. Uh, Pyramid Games sent me a, a DM on, on Twitter about this. Um, like they're having a major update to the game. And they were wondering if, uh, if I'd want to play it on stream. I said, yeah, that sounds great. If I can help get the word out about this this lovely game, I'm going to do it. But look, Danny Anduza will be streaming the gameplay of Dinosaur Fossil Hunter. This is a unique opportunity to not only see the latest version of the game, but also to hear feedback on it from a real-life paleontologist and scientist. We are sure that it will be a valuable time filled with fun and substantive knowledge. There we go. And there is the link. Let's click it. Let's see where that brings us. Oh, hang on. I don't know if that worked. Anyway. Um, that link doesn't work. No, it goes to a Steam community page. Uh, but yeah, yeah, here. I gotta open up Steam on my machine now. Updating again? I just ran it this morning, so it update, because I knew it's been like a year since I opened Steam. It's updating again. Okay. Might be a minute. Yeah. Mavk14, Paleontology, Valiosiraptor. Valiosiraptor? So I have a Velociraptor on Valium. I think Dr. Mendoza would win. Map K14. Crack me up. Goodness. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. And rate him a bow. Is the mic at the wrong angle? What do you mean? Yeah, it... It is where I usually have it. You know? Yeah. All right. Steam View Games Library. I remember how to do this. There we go. We've got a bunch of fixes, bug fixes, optimizations and polish and new content. Here for Dinosaur Fossil Hunter. Let's Open it up here. Here we go. And just a second here. Oh shoot, how do I, is it tab? Control tab? Somebody help me out here. How do we get the, uh, the is, it, is it escape? Alt tab, thank you. There we are. Yeah. Good stuff. This update brings a lot of improvements compared to the previous version. We had to reset settings to default. Sorry for the trouble. I don't even remember what my settings were, honestly. So, no harm done to me, I'm sure. We hope it won't be necessary in the future. You know what? Okay. And good stuff. Okay. Here, let's continue here. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to see if I can remember live how the controls for this work. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. And Heritage, you know about the game doesn't work for you? You're muted or blocked? What do you mean, Heritage Nomad? Yeah. Step one, find the any key. Yeah, where's the any key, SB? Press any button to start. Where is it? Where's... Where's the any key? Oh, there it is. Yeah. Here we are in our lovely museum. Because, as of course, 
when it comes to important fossils from a scientific perspective. Where does that kind of thing belong? That belongs in a museum! Oh, yeah. Look at me remembering to use the W-A-S-N-D keys. This looks like it used to be uh, a gymnasium here, and it has been converted to a fossil museum. To me, that is some wish fulfillment. I, uh... I can only dream of that sort of thing happening. Well, we, we might actually have something like that happening in the future. We are working on digging up two dromaeosaurs here. I think dromaeosaurus and Utah raptor. But you know what? I actually want to go out and, uh... And go dig up some more fossils. Medium storage. So I gotta go to the desk in order to do that. Which is... Um, trying to remember how to do this. Bear with me here. I love the City Museum of Paleontology. Every proper city should have a museum of paleontology. Yeah. Um. Oh, that just makes me smile. Oh, I love it. Let's see. I think I remember it was in here. There is a map somewhere. Ready to assemble zero. Okay. There we go. And I think we want to leave the great state of Washington. And part of me almost wonders if the game developers who are Probably not from the U.S. I'm thinking about, like, where should we set our museum? Oh, in Washington. Thinking Washington, D.C. Instead, it's in Washington State. Or maybe they were thinking about the Burke Museum in Seattle, Washington. Or maybe they thought, well, Washington's not super far from Montana, so that would make sense. Anyway, that looks interesting. Up in... Alberta. Dromaeosaurus and Ornithomimus. And we've got these dinosaurs down here in... There. I kind of want to go up here. I don't think we've been up to Alberta yet. Let's try here. Yeah. And I did Metazoo for today earlier, Sloppy Salamander. So we'll do two episodes, uh, two instances of Metazoo tomorrow. Yeah. Rizudegas has stopped stealing Canadian dinosaurs. You know, I'm not going to get into international dinosaur paleontology politics here. But uh, there are plenty of Canadian crews who come down and buy fossils from the U.S. Or dig them up here. Turn about is fair play, you know? Anyway, press any button to start. Here's the any button right there. And here we are. Yeah. All right. I'm trying to regain my bearings here. Let's take a look at this depot here. This is some pretty swanky stuff. We've got, what, wooden crates on top of pallets? Rarely do we actually have these in the field. We've got these lovely fluid canisters here. Canister refiller. Ah, press E to pack digging access assets. There we go. We've got a lovely... 
tough book or whatever this is here. Good stuff. Let's go over to our truck. And let's make sure that we are fully packed up here. Excellent. We've got a generator. We've got fuel. We've got crates. We've got some ammo canisters with presumably some sort of important gear inside it. And this is like one of those old uh, Datsun or, or Toyota pickups. They're great vehicles. Let's close this up. And... Let's see. Oh, and I can sprint now, too? Left, shift. Ooh, I like that. Very cool. All right, here we are in the vehicle. And... Let us sally forth. Alright, trying to remember how to do this properly. Gotta keep the mouse at just the right angle. I never was very good at the whole WASD thing. But we'll make it work. Alright, mine office. Mine office. Kodali says, and Danny drives a truck. I've driven plenty of trucks, Kodali. I used to drive a, drive a truck for a living. Though it may not seem like much, 500 bits goes a long way. Oh, no. Supporting science, I'll preach here on Twitch. Hey, gamer. Uh, I, you've got me confused with someone else, Delta Rain. Thank you for the 500 bits, though. <laughs> yeah, we are indeed playing some Dinosaur Fossil Hunter today. This is a rare event. I gotta say. But we're, uh... We're making it happen. And I do want to check on something real quick. Alt tab is how you do it, okay. I may actually have... Um... There we go. A little bit of a cheat sheet here. Okay, okay. Hmm. Excellent. map here. Lake, lake, lake. And... That's not this. You know, I think we might be in the wrong, wrong map. So, let's, uh... Back to the main menu here. And I think we want to go to... What did I call it? Oh, it auto-saved from there, didn't it? Um... Yeah, what we want to do... Oh no, hang on. I see some lakes there. Oh, 
Tap. Um. No, we don't want legs. Never mind. What we want to do is go back to. Go back to the museum and go to a different site. Because there's some new cool stuff to show everybody. And I want to make sure I get to that. Let's do it. I think. Unknown species, unknown species. I think we want to go here. That looks about right. Yeah. Travel. There we go. Yeah. And the gem GM. I don't know anything about that other game. <laughs> I'm not a pharmaceutical rep. What are you talking about? Here we are. I think this is when I see this. Because this is supposed to be, like, roughly equivalent to, like, the Hell Creek Formation in southwest Montana. This reminds me of Ekalaka, Montana. There's our map there. This looks more correct. Yeah. Um, is there between those... Oh, the second fork there. Excellent. Yeah, okay, okay. Fuel canisters, car location. Hub locations. We want to go cross that river. A fancy piece of equipment, too. I mean, a lot of paper maps in the field. I think only once have I ever used a tablet in the field. A non-chalk tablet, you know? There's plenty of slate tablets with chalk. But never an electronic one like this. Maybe only one time. Um. Yeah. And there we go. How do I get rid of the tablet? <laughs> Tune in and watch a dinosaur paleontologist struggle with the basic controls of a video game. You know? Escape does do it. Okay, I thought escape was just pause, but no, it's not. It's this too. Let's hop in here. And we want to go across that river. Um, first, let me make sure that we've got everything we need in the back of the truck. Alright, we've got excavation equipment. We've got... Disassembled crates. Both small and medium. Let's go ahead and close her up. Let's get going. It's funny, everything is so much more clean and pretty than it really is out in the field. So everything is so less dilapidated. Um, but again, you know... Game like this is wish fulfillment. It is. It's supposed to be brighter and cheerier and more fun than the real thing. You know? Yeah.
All right. Let's go cross this river. And go right into the bank there. All right. I think what we want to do... I think we want to take a left here. This is like an old... Russian gas truck or something, isn't it? Ooh, and it appears we have a road over here. Well, 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 let's go take a look. Yeah, have you ever been on tour with an older painted military truck? I've never been out in the field with a true military vehicle, but I used to have an old uh, 1988 Suzuki Samurai. Um, and that was, uh, that was pretty close to a military vehicle. For space to skip securing the area. No, let's secure the area. Oh, man. We're building a, a field tent out there. Very nice. Yeah, excellent. And I think maybe this is where we're supposed to be. Looks like it. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, and check this out. Oh, man, I wish it were this easy in real life. We've got a beautiful... Uh, like, on-site temporary structure here. Uh, those of you who were, uh, who were with me this past summer in the field... Maybe you remember the that temporary garage that we had that looks kind of like this, but far less fancy. Um, didn't have a floor, certainly. This has a floor made of real wood? Wow, wow, wow. Um, and bunks? Luxury. This is brilliant. We've got our management station here. Let's take a look at that. We can call drones! This is like magic. Oh, I love it. Um, I wish we had this kind of thing in real life. But they'll just fly away with our pallets? Full of fossils? That is, uh... Oh, man. Here. I think we've got tools on our person, don't we? Yeah, look. The stuff's already unloaded out of the back of the truck. Let's go prospecting. Got pallets for crates, sir. So, what you're about to witness here is this game's version of prospecting for fossils. That's what we call it when we're out in the field and we're looking for for fossil specimens. It's called prospecting. And the way that it works in real life is that it's not as cinematic or as uh, as I don't know fun as this. In real life, we walk along and we stare at the ground and we, for, we look for little bits of bone that are sticking out of the surrounding rock. We look for things that have rolled down a hill, things that have been exposed by natural erosion. And they're there on the surface, just bits and pieces of crumbled bone waiting for us to see and pick up, trace back to the source, and then we dig in. Here, it's more gamified, of course, because this is a video game. Uh, send drone to the gas station to get snacks, says Pimpcat. Yeah, exactly, right? Wish we could do that in real life. So normally, in, you know, in real life, we'd be walking over the outcrop, just looking for bits of bone exposed at the surface. And that's, that's not quite how this game works. So what we're going to do instead here is we are going to use... Ah, uh, this is supposed to be basically like a handheld radiation detector device. And how does this work again? We're supposed to put down flags, and the hotkey for that is... It's not gloves. Um... Oh. Left click. 
very simple. I get another one right here. So, I want to emphasize that we only experimentally have devices like this been used in actual dinosaur paleontology. Jim Kirkland could tell you all about that. There's actually a couple of people... I think it was Carol and Ramal Jones. They actually figured out how to... how to make a, a device like this. But it was far more rudimentary. It didn't actually have, like, a visual component to it. It's not like it could show you a picture of what was there under the surface. Instead, it was basically just like a Geiger counter with a big uh, lead shield over the top of it. And uh, and the, the frame of it itself was almost like a lawnmower. And you would push it over the ground and it would go... It would, I think, basically emit sound when there was something under the ground that had higher levels of radiation. Because in very under very, very specific circumstances, like in particular geological formations, in, in very specific parts of the world, uh, fossil bones can be a little bit more radioactive than the surrounding matrix, the surrounding rock. And hello, hello to Bonji. Their Bonji and their 15 raiders are about to get flattened by dinosaur content. To raid, yes indeed, Doc Vamps. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's wonderful to have you here. Thanks for joining us. To Bonji, how was your stream? And what did you get up to? Yeah. Um... What were you doing here? Uh, Builders of Greece. Well, well, well. That sounds pretty neat. To Bonji. How much Greece did you build? <laughs> if it went well. Hope you had fun. Yeah, stream is good. Early access city builder sent, set in ancient Greece. Well, did you build, uh, did you build an Agora today? Or maybe that's Rome. It's probably both, isn't it? Anyway, good stuff. I'm glad you're here. Holy cow. Uh, for anybody who's new, just waltzing in here with Tabanji, welcome, welcome to Paleontology. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. And today we're playing a dinosaur paleontology simulator game called Dinosaur Fossil Hunter. This is probably the first game I've played in maybe like a year and a half. Um... Yeah, um, I don't play a lot of video games here. Normally, we're talking about fossils, talking about natural history, talking about dinosaurs, oftentimes, because dinosaurs are what I study, what I publish on, what I dig up during the summers. I'm all about dinosaurs, and about this grand history of life on Earth in general, of which dinosaurs are a very cool part. But recently, um... Pyramid Games reached out to me. Um, here's their Steam page there. Right there on Steam. And uh, they were really excited for me to try some of the new updates there on Dinosaur Fossil Hunter. This wonderful uh, dinosaur paleontology simulator. So that's what we're doing today. It's a very charming game. I think you're going to like it. And we'll get back into it in a minute. Yeah. Um, Ariath Thallium says, Danny is not an archaeologist. This is true. I'm a paleontologist. Very different. I'm like... It actually is very different. Paleontologists study fossils. Which is the fossilized remains of... Ancient living things. When I say ancient, I mean ancient enough to be fossilized. That can go from just about 10,000 years ago all up until about 3.8 billion years ago. Dinosaur fossils, for instance, from the Mesozoic era, are 66 million years old. 
at the very youngest, all the way back to almost 240 million years old at the oldest. Whereas archaeologists are digging up things that are, at maximum, a few thousand years old. So yeah, yeah. Are permafrost mummies considered fossils? They're not. World cast, no. Um, because they're frozen. Yeah. Uh, fossils are... Generally, they require some permineralization in order to be considered fossils. Um, here, I'll, uh, I'll show you. What is a fossil and how do you become one? Here's a step-by-step -step guide to becoming a fossil. Step one, die. Once you are dead, your remains may be scavenged by other organisms. Yeah. Step two, get buried fast. If you are buried rapidly, your remains won't completely decay or be carried away by scavengers. Your best bet for rapid burial is to die near or in a river, lake, or ocean, where water yep. can deposit sediment. Very over funny, Mickey Marty. Step three, <laughs> soak in groundwater for a long, long time. Groundwater contains minerals. Over time, dissolved minerals can harden after filling in cavities in your skeleton. Or the water can dissolve your skeleton, leaving only minerals in its place. And so this is what fossilization means. Once something gets buried and the soft parts rot away, or sometimes if some of the soft parts are still there, like in very rare instances, you still get preserved skin or feathers or even internal organs in a fossil. In order for it to become fossilized, it's got to be buried and then you get permineralization. Things get permineralized. Minerals soak into it through groundwater, or maybe they leach in from the surrounding matrix, the surrounding sediment like that. But this is what separates a fossil from other remains. The thing is, if something does not become fossilized, it will not survive for millions of years. There's no way. It just won't. Um, that's like permafrost mammoths and stuff like that. They're not going to be around in a million years. They have not been around for a million years. They've been around frozen for a few thousand years. Um, and that's really it. You know? In order to survive for millions of years, you have to become fossilized, where you basically turn to stone via natural processes like this. For a long, long time. Yeah. Groundwater contains minerals. Over time, dissolved minerals can harden after filling in cavities in your skeleton. Yep. Or the water can dissolve your skeleton, leaving only minerals in its place. Either way, your skeleton will turn to stone, and you'll be a fossil. Yeah. Uh, Necromantis' long-term jerky storage remains an unsolved problem. Yes, because if you permineralize it, it, it nobody's going to want to eat it. You know? Yeah. Gemini Wood says, how long does it take? It depends on the particular circumstances. But this can take anywhere from a few thousand years to maybe a few million years. Well, nah, well, probably not that long. It takes somewhere between, like, many hundreds of years to many thousands of years for something to fossilize. Um, yeah. Um, and the conditions have to be just right. Fossils, like, a lot of things have to go exactly right for something to actually become a fossil. Step yeah. four, wait to be exposed. As the years go by, if you're lucky, sea levels can fall or rock can erode and expose you. Then if your luck holds out, you might get spotted by a fossil hunter and wind up in a museum collection where scientists can study you to learn about evolution. Oh yeah, that's the dream, you know? Uh, for any kind of organism, it's become a fossil, you know? And OG Zilla says, so a fossil is not really a bone, but a stone cast where the bone used to be? In some cases, yes. It's a spectrum. So in some cases, you get beautiful preservation where, you know, the individual cells inside the bone are still visible, and there still might be some original organic material in there, like collagen, like red blood cells, stuff like that. You know, you still got... You know, and it still kind of, like, smells like fresh bone. It's got, like, a really interesting odor to it. 
if it's extremely well preserved like that. And then sometimes you have it where the original bone is completely dissolved and there's only minerals there. So it's a spectrum, and it could be kind of anywhere along that line. Um, like most things in nature, it's very much a spectrum. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. And fossilizing is different to petrifying something, right? It, it depends who you ask, Don. Different... Even different paleontologists um, use those terms differently. And, and geologists. Um, yeah. Here, let's take a look at this from the Natural History Museum. Uh, how do dinosaur fossils form? How, let's see if this is any good. I don't know if I've seen this before. Millions of years ago, this dinosaur was going about his normal daily life. Oh, we have seen this. Yeah, they didn't really play tennis. Uh. But his day went from good... And thanks, Husker Raptor. ...to really bad. After he died, other dinosaurs ate him. And the rest of his skin and muscles... Were and I, I appreciate this. This is supposed to be an Apatosaurus or a Diplodocus, maybe? And we actually have dinosaurs which are coeval with it. We've got Ceratosaurus and Allosaurus, both of which lived in the same time and the same place. So many, like, this should be correct, given that it's the Natural History Museum, and good on them for getting it correct. But so many, in so many different pieces of dinosaur media, you see all of these, like, different dinosaurs from different time periods kind of mixed together as if they were actually coeval as if they were actually neighbors living at the same time same place but the age of dinosaurs is extremely long um here uh let me show you just in the state of utah we've got at least 27 distinct faunas of dinosaurs. Faunae. Different environments that had dinosaurs at different times. So each one of these that you see, like, with horizontal lines right here, this is from the very end of the Cretaceous. These dinosaurs lived alongside each other at the end of the Cretaceous. T-Rex and Alamosaurus and Ankylosaurid and Aceratopsian and Hadrosaurs. So all these guys were neighbors. But before them were other kinds of dinosaurs. So, like, each one of these is a distinct faunal level, a different environment, a different ecosystem with different dinosaurs. The Age of Dinosaurs is this constantly changing cast of characters because it's extremely long. Dinosaurs were around for like over 160 million years. And they're constantly evolving and changing and certain kinds are going extinct because conditions on Earth are constantly changing and it's... It really is this just grand and beautiful pageant of life on Earth, and we're so privileged to be able to study that. You know? Yeah. Um. But yeah. And Halska Raptor says, I dare say the age of dinosaurs never truly ended. Yeah, if I had an updated version of this, I could show you. We're still living in the age of dinosaurs, if you want to go by number of species. Birds are dinosaurs, and, uh, Birds outnumber mammal species like two to one. How many, how many modern species of birds are there, Chat? Over nine thousand. Yeah, they they outnumber mammal species like two to one. So, you know, you can call it the age of birds if you want to. Anyway, yeah, yeah, I know, right, Mayor Space? Can you believe it? <laughs> yeah, Alexander Morrison says hello. All good to see. Big Al's head in the corner there. Oh, this isn't. This is actually way bigger than Big Al's skull. Big Al doesn't have a particularly big skull. Um, this is kind of like a composite Allosaurus fragilis, and Big Al is Allosaurus gemadsoni. Anyway, I don't want to get too into the weeds there, but uh, but it is indeed Allosaurus there, Alexander Morrison. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Nothing about says, how old can an individual dinosaur get? Is it similar to today's species? The very oldest, the most mature dinosaur? The dinosaur was that was the oldest when it died that we have so far, I think was like 48 years old. So not 
not particularly old, especially for how big dinosaurs got. A lot of them lived fast and died young, you know? Like James Dean, I guess. But yeah. Yeah. Mayor of Space says, how does the total biomass of all living mammals and birds compare to each other? Um... That's a good question, Mayor of Space. Birds are so lightweight that it's... We're comparing apples to... to hollow oranges. I don't... That's a good question. I really don't know the answer to that, Mayor of Space. That's a good, good question. I could talk about that for a long time, but I'm trying not to get too distracted here. Um, where did dinosaur fossils come from? Here, let's let's get back to this. Uh, away, leaving just his bones. Just his bones. These were quickly buried by mud. Mud. Over millions of years, more layers landed on top. Mud, sand, and even volcanic ash. Yep. This added up to a lot of weight on top of the skeleton. Some parts got crushed. The layers of mud, sand, and ash turned into hard, sedimentary rocks. Yep. While this was happening, water seeped into the bones. There we go. It left behind minerals, turning the bones to stone and creating a fossil. Yep. And that kind of mineralization, you can even witness this in your own home right now. Has any... Do any of you have experience with a shower head that gets kind of crusted over with minerals from the water. Have you ever seen this before? Some people call it hard water buildup. But this is just in municipal tap water, which is heavily filtered and and made safe for human consumption. It's much like cleaner than water that you would see out seeping through the ground in nature. But even there, you get mineral buildup like this. Like limescale, kind of OG Zill, yeah, yeah. Um Yeah. And there you go, Lenina. Um That was an old trip when I would help friends move. Back when I lived in Montana, because, you know, as a, as a university student, you know, all of your friends are just constantly moving to new apartments all the time. Um, one of the things that I would do is bring a bottle of, a bottle of vinegar and, uh, and some thick rubber bands or duct tape and a plastic bag. And you put the, you pour some vinegar into that plastic bag, you put it up over the shower head, and then you, you cinch up the top of it. And you just let that vinegar dissolve the minerals oh. there. The creature we will be examining is a paleontologist. And Sala Sank, how are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing. What's well, shaking? It's good to have you here. How was your stream? From loot to bones. Uh, we've traveled through time from looting in last epoch to dig up some real treasures with you. Well, I'm glad you're here. J Slab, Sala Sank, and Silas Ebank too. Oh, Silas B. Bank. Sorry, <laughs> it looked like you were also doing the copy pasta there. But no. And Humbuggin says citric acid smells better. That also works. Yeah. It can be a bit more expensive, though, sometimes. Citric acid. The vinegar. But yeah. And there you go, Mayor Space. Well, sometimes it's attached to the wall, and you don't want to do that. I don't know. But yeah. Yeah. And Sinus Sank. Oh, okay. Oh, Siasank. Siasank. Like Cychania. There's a dinosaur. Yeah. Cychania. Beautiful ankylosaur from Mongolia. Um. A dinosaur! Gigantic dinosaurs attacking our boy! A dinosaur? What? Aerith, double eight, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizer. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Sysank. I appreciate you. Can we get another shout out for, for Sysank there? Yeah. 
Um, a dinosaur! Gigantic dinosaurs attacking our boy! A dinosaur? What? what? Uh, it's rare that we've got the same alert twice in a row. I've got like 150 alerts. So J Slab, I don't know what how you just did that, but thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Um, good stuff. And last epoch. That sounds that sounds very final there. More final than Final Fantasy. Apparently there's more than one Final Fantasy game. You would think that wouldn't be the case, given the title, but... The things you learn as as a paleontologist streaming on Twitch, you know? There's more than one Final Fantasy game? And... Yeah. Um... Anyway. Anyway. And The Legend of Zelda is all about Link. Well, that's, may or space, that makes sense, because Zelda herself is only a legend. She's not real, you know? Yeah. Um. Anyway. Yeah. There's only 17 Final Fantasies, oddly enough. You know, it... Laws against false advertising are, uh, full of loopholes, apparently. Anyway, we're talking about how dinosaur fossils uh, become fossils, and then we'll get back into dinosaur fossil hunter. Earth yeah. changed a lot over. And thank you, Sysank. I appreciate that. Rocks that were once deep underground it's good rose to, have to the surface. A process called uplift. Yep. Very slowly, wind, water, and ice wore away the rock. Eventually, bits of the fossil skeleton were exposed and became exposed. visible on the surface. Yeah, this Fossils is how we find them. Are constantly getting eroded out of rock. Yep. Most are lost. But if we're lucky, someone will find one. Yippee! Nearly all of the fossils we find, around 99%, are from marine animals, such as shellfish and sharks. By the, I mean, this by individual numbers, sure. In sea, where sand or mud could bury their remains quickly after they died. True. But dinosaurs live on land, so how do they get buried so quickly? Well, they usually didn't. Most of them did not. But sometimes, if you lived in the sort of area that's conducive to you being covered by waterborne sediments, then that would happen. Um, if you lived out on the floodplain or near swamps or rivers or streams or areas like that, then uh, it's a little bit more likely that you would get lucky enough to become a fossil. Most dinosaur fossils we find belong to animals that were living near to a lake or a river. Yep. They died, and a short while later the area flooded, covering the remains in mud and silt. Occasionally, something more dramatic happened. In one example, <laughs> two dinosaurs, Protoceratops and Velociraptor, yep. were fighting in the desert. Yeah, uh huh. They were mid-battle when... Suddenly, a sand dune collapsed on top of them. I, I don't actually think that's what happened. All right. Chat, let's... Okay. Come here, a little bit closer. Let me tell you a secret. Between you and me... That might have actually been a collapsing burrow. A burrow like a den, an underground den. May have actually done that. Would make a lot more sense than, uh, than this. They were mid-battle when, suddenly, a sand dune collapsed on top of them. Yeah. Their fossils show them frozen in their fighting poses. Uh, this is actually a remarkable fossil. I... I... I wish they'd actually shown it. Um, it is incredible. These two animals still locked in mortal combat. Um, Yeah, 
hang on a second. Um... Bear with me here. Um, nope. Don't want to get copyright nuked for that. Thank you very much. Um, let's try this, perhaps. Yeah, that'll work. Incredible fossil here. Where these two animals are locked in some kind of... Yeah. Preserved together for about 70 million years. They're called the Fighting Dinosaurs from the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. A Velociraptor and a Protoceratops. There, there's never been another dinosaur fossil found like this before. Um, yeah. Two dinosaurs enter. Zero. Dinosaurs leave? Yeah. They're, they didn't leave. They're still there. Although they were... You can now see these in the, uh... The museum in, uh... In Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. In the capital city of the nation of Mongolia. Um, pretty incredible specimen there. And there's a lovely representation of this. Velociraptor and Protoceratops. Fight, fight, fightin'. Fight! <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. In another tragic example, the feathered dinosaur City Patti was sitting on its nest of eggs when a sandstorm blew in and covered it. Fossils like this, from animals that were alive when they were buried, are really rare. True. It's not just bones that turn into fossils. Dinosaurs can also leave behind footprints and impressions of skin and feathers. Dinosaur footprints are actually more common so, than dinosaur bones. Um, we have more documented dinosaur footprints than we have actual dinosaur, you know, body fossils. And it makes sense, because you're walking around leaving tons of footprints all over the place, but you only leave one body. Usually. Your own, you know? Some people in this chat, I don't know. <laughs> Um, but yeah. Prints and impressions of skin and feathers. I'm just so kidding. Next time you're, you're all a bunch of sandstone or mudstone. Wonderful, kindly people. Think of what fossils could I be hiding, you. just waiting to be discovered. No comment, says Lenina. Yeah. It probably won't be a dinosaur fossil, as they're so rare. Yeah. But it could be a prehistoric sea creature, like an ammonite, which went extinct at the same time as dinosaurs. Many Except for birds. millions of years yeah. ago. Yeah. Good stuff. And yeah, Trader Tots, what a great name. Yeah, the in St. George, Utah, they have... Let me see if I can find a really brief video about this. Uh, an incredible track site. In, uh, in St. George. Holy moly. Yeah, my friend Liz used to actually be director of this museum for like, I think a little under a year. Until she moved to North Dakota. Because because uh, her husband got a job running a museum in North Dakota. And it's like, well, shoot, we're not going to live halfway across the country from each other. Um, uh, my yeah. name is Dr. Jerry Harris. But and, uh, and... I once provided merchandise to this museum as well. I used to sell my stickers and stuff back there. Long time ago, back when I did merchandise to make a living. But yeah, this is an awesome place. Really, really cool. Well, my name is Dr. Jerry Harris. I've been the advisor to the site here for 14 years. The I've heard his name so many times, I've never actually museum. 
Uh, put a face to a name like this. This treasures that have been discovered in the area. So we have yeah. mostly what are considered trace fossils, uh, which are features in sedimentary rock and that are animals in the act of behaving while they were alive 200 million. You do have a few dinosaur fossils from Southern California, but they're very rare, Trappy Jenkins, and they're ones that happen to drift out to sea. They were castaway dinosaurs. Very, very rare, because that whole area was underwater during the age of the dinosaurs. Uh, we don't have much by way of archaeological stuff. We are a natural history museum that focuses Beautiful. strictly on the paleontology from the early Jurassic stuff at this site. The site was discovered in the year 2000 by Dr. Sheldon Johnson, who was an optometrist yeah. who lives here in town. Uh, he was leveling some property he had here in order to make it commercially available, but discovered right of dinosaur tracks on the site instead. The museum serves a, mostly an educational purpose. Uh, we, we are here to uh, educate people on the paleontology of this area, on uh, the nature of what dinosaurs were doing as they were living animals. Most natural history museums you go to that have dinosaur skeletons uh, are great attractions, but what you're looking at are the remains of dead animals. Yep. Here at the site, we Good have point. fossils that were made by living animals. And so we can interpret a lot about the dinosaur's behavior from the fossils we have here at the site. The museum was built directly over the track site itself. Uh, the, all the tracks that you see, all the fossils that you see here in our museum came right from this spot. And a number of them are actually still in place. Uh, and not Very many museums cool. can say that. Most museums have fossils that came from a wide variety of other locations. Our fossils yeah. are from right here. Some of the main attractions of our museum, we have the world's largest track block, uh, which is a 26 and a half ton block that is covered with over 50 footprints. Uh, wow. We have a crouching dinosaur trace, which is one of only about a dozen of those that are known anywhere in the world. Yeah, this is very cool. This is probably from a dinosaur like Dilophosaurus. You see the three toes right there? And then you see the metatarsal. So this is the back part of the foot, which um, when the animal is walking around... Yeah, there we go. The so the foot extends from here up to here. Those are the metatarsals right there. So that essentially is the heel right there. Dinosaurs walked on their on their tiptoes. These are the metatarsals in here. So this whole thing, that whole surface, is the foot right there. If we're going by the actual bones, you know? Yeah. And uh, that's what you see right here is an impression of the back of the foot. And that's the heel right there. So this animal, this is all like folded up like this. And uh, yeah, pretty cool, right? And we have the world's largest collection of swimming dinosaur tracks. Uh, in addition yeah. to that, we also have a fossil preparation laboratory where uh, people can actually watch fossils in the process of being prepared. Very and cool. We have a, a little dino park where kids most creatures play. walk on their toes. Um, You're right, Happy Nightmares. Yeah. Model dinosaur and get the picture yeah. taken on it. Uh, we have an outdoor exhibit that we're constructing out there right now. So we have a, a beautifully stocked gift shop with very unique items uh, that you can't find at pretty much any other store. Yeah, some of my uh, vinyl decals used to, they're probably not, when was this video from? Four years ago. Yeah, that's after I stopped producing this. A walk through time yeah. so people can actually understand what fossils were like uh, time periods other than what we have represented here in the museum. So our site is here for both families and for dinosaur enthusiasts. Both Very of them cool. coming through will get a, a high yeah. educational experience that I don't think they can get at almost any other museum anywhere in the world. Uh, where we're learning huh. strictly about the fossil behaviors of animals rather than about the fossil animals themselves. It is a unique place. Our museum puts the dinosaurs and their other animals that lived here at the time back into an actual context. They're not just static animals standing there. They actually uh, come alive because you can see exactly what they were doing here 200 million years ago. It's so very anybody cool. anybody who wants that experience, anybody who wants that educational experience is going to love this museum. Yeah. Good stuff. If it hadn't been for that great dinosaur who saved us from the American forces, we would all be dead. Will six two? Is that is that true? How be Danny and Chad? <laughs> thank you for the eight months of support. By the way, holy cow! Thank you, thank you. Anyway, let's get back to the game here, dude. Um, and humans are plantigrades, yeah, rather than digitigrades, yeah. That's true, House Raptor, yeah. Yeah, I could go into more detail about that, but, oh man, we gotta get back to our game.
Um, here we are in Dinosaur Fossil Hunter. So let's continue. Oh, you know what? For anybody who, uh, uh, hang on a second. Anybody just joining us? We are playing Dinosaur Fossil Hunter right now, which is a lovely paleontology simulator game. As a dinosaur paleontologist, this brings such joy to my heart. taking what I do, what I live for, making it a video game to be shared with the public to help capture some of that sense of exploration and wonder and, and discovery that's inherent to this line of work and gamifying, yeah. if that's the right word to use. Pretty excellent. Pretty excellent stuff. Hulk Raptor says, "What animals are we hoping to find in our dig sites? Fossilized ones." Hulk Raptor. Now, um, I have heard tell that we might be dealing with a certain Lambiosaurine hadrosaur, um, whose crest might resemble, it may or may not resemble that of a, a you know. The helmet of a, a Corinthian soldier. And then we might also have a uh, a large winged pterosaur with no teeth. You might even call it a wings with no teeth kind of creature, if you catch my drift. Anyway, let's get into uh, the game here. Oh, wrong button. Let's get into the game here. Yeah, uh, so we find ourselves at a new fossil site here, and I did do today's metazoo, or I did yesterday's metazoo. We can do two tomorrow, but I'm not letting that one expire, Lenina, or Phoenix the Archaeologist. We're all, we're all good. Uh, Magnum, yeah, there you go, Oscar Raptor. Um, so what are we gonna do here? I've already flagged. Some spots that look promising for fossils. So. How does this work again? Oh, I gotta use the pick first, don't I? That's how it works. Yeah. So this is a big ol' rock pick. We use a similar one in the field, like a Geopaleo pick. And if you'd like, I can show you that in a minute. It doesn't work nearly this fast in real life. But again, this is a game. And so it's not going to be 1000% authentic in the way that it works. Yeah. Don't dig yourself a hole you can't jump out of. I can dig my way out, Jody Fish. I can dig up if I need to. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. Would you Would you like to see the the pick that I use in the field for overburden work like this? Let me Let me go grab that and I'll show you. It's right here, ladies and gents, and everybody else is uh, is what my old boss, Denver Fowler, used to call a super pick. But the official name is a Geo Paleo pick. In fact, it says that right there. This is a fairly new one, and so it still has the uh, it still has the inscription there on the side. It's made by Estwing. 
A few good crew members who are well practiced with these are a more effective force in digging up a dinosaur than anything that's ever been rolled off the line at the Caterpillar factory. Or anything that's ever rolled out of the uh, out of the doors at John Deere. Few people who know how to use this really well can move mountains. Small mountains, maybe. But I've done that. This in capable hands is a thing it of wonder. Cheap. Yeah. I guess your caterpillar spots. Yeah, there you go. It wakes arts. <laughs> Darn it. So close. But yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. You can see how the, the paint is already worn off. I've only ever, I've only used this for like one season so far, really. But, uh, that's why the tip is still relatively sharp here. And what was brand new, it was so sharp. But yeah, when we're digging through rock like this, um, this sort of thing is invaluable. Doesn't go quite this fast, but, you know, it is a video game. Yeah. So what we're trying to do here is separate this. I think, can we use the scanny thing now? Um, trying to remember what is the... I guess we have to completely remove all of this. Oh, and hello, Sweetie Pie. Hang on a minute. Sweetie Pie, how are you doing? Now it's time for the cat cam. How are you doing, sweetie? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. You want to see how we talk about how we dig dinosaurs in real life and compare that to uh, to this wonderful game here? Yeah. Oh, sweetie pie. Yeah. She's making the rounds, doing her inspections for the day. Anyway, let's uh, let's continue here. I gotta say, I, I like the music in this game. It's, uh... Compelling without being distracting. And that's, that's a, a difficult line to... That's a difficult thing to... To pull off sometimes. I think I gotta use the shovel now, which is, what, four? big old slab right there. And in this game, a big slab like that often contains an important fossil. So let's take a look. Seven is the bone sniffer. There we go. Oh, they changed it. It looks different now. Oh, it looks more like an actual handheld Geiger counter. And there's no bone in this rock. Okay. Oh, this is what we're going to talking about. talk about. Let me, uh, this must have been challenging in, in putting t this game together and trying to come up with a way to, to gamify prospecting for fossils. In real life, we just walk along and stare at the ground in order to actually discover fossils in the first place. And that wouldn't necessarily make for compelling gameplay in a game like this. So that presents a challenge. If you're going to make a dinosaur paleontology simulator, how in the world do you do you make that part of it compelling? And I think they came up with kind of an elegant solution here. Some 
a very few fossil bones are actually mildly radioactive, enough to be detectable by, by sensitive equipment. Um, and Tone says, wouldn't it also be an element of geophysical scans? That sort of thing does not work. No. That might work in archaeology. You can use things like ground-penetrating radar. But archaeologists are digging in soil. Whereas paleontologists are digging in rock. And so we've got a completely different way of doing things. The methods that might work in archaeology for finding, say, pottery shards or the walls of an ancient city or something like that, those absolutely will not work in dinosaur paleontology. Um, because the, the bone and the rock are essentially the same consistency, the same density, you wouldn't be able to pick that apart with, with ground penetrating radar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here's a clip with Jim Jensen talking about how we actually find dinosaur fossils in the first place. A rock saw there. Oh boy. We never dig until we see dinosaur bone coming out of the ground. And he's right about that. We need to actually find bits of fossil bone poking out of the ground before we know where to dig. That's the only way that you find dinosaur bone, uh, usually. There are some very, very rare exceptions to that. Like what, um, what, uh, Carol Jones and, and Ramal Jones were able to do in the Cedar Mountain Formation and the Morrison Formation. But there, some of the bones are mildly radioactive, and so you can sometimes, with a lot of trial and error, actually use like a, a kind of radiation detector to find them. But that's that's never really been done anywhere else in the world, to my knowledge. Otherwise, yeah. we might dig forever and never find a bone. Yep. But to find a dinosaur bone or skeleton, one must walk a long ways, climb a lot of sweaty mountains, and uh, go thirsty and be subjected to gnats and heat and that sort of thing. <laughs> but when you find something like this, it may be something that's never been seen before. New species. So it's an exciting pursuit. This is the vertebrae right up next to the skull. Yeah, um, good stuff. Yeah. Um... And he's got a sun helmet there, Pimp Cat. Yeah, Jim Jensen was kind of famous for uh, wearing a sun helmet. Sun helmet. Yeah. Here's the same guy talking about how in the places where he digs, sometimes the fossils are mildly radioactive, though. Take a look. But in 1979, Jim Jensen searched a new site at Dry Mesa in Utah. It's in Colorado, actually, I think. Dry Mesa, Colorado? On the Colorado Plateau, you can find dinosaurs with a Geiger counter because the bones have absorbed uranium oxide from water as they fossilized. Yep. Remember we were talking about the uh, that process of absorbing the groundwater in order to fossilize? You've got radioactive groundwater can concentrate in the bones and create a situation where the bones are slightly more radioactive than the surrounding matrix, the surrounding rock. And that's what's going on here. I don't think Jim Jensen's ever actually found a dinosaur using this method. But camera crews love it, you know? Oh, yeah. Huskaraptor says, do we know why fossils sometimes gain radioactivity? Yeah, it's because the just the groundwater in that area will be more radioactive. Yeah. Yeah. You can find dinosaurs with a Geiger counter because the bones have absorbed uranium oxide from water as they fossilized. Yep. Now, with that being said, um, I actually received a radiation detector from a ge very generous member of, of this community 
right before I left for the field last summer. Um, I was delayed by one day in leaving for the field, and it showed up on that day. And so I was able to take it out there. And I was a little disappointed because none of the bones that I that I tried were even mildly... They were undetectable compared to the surrounding rock. Um, you could put the sensor right up on the surface of the bone itself, and it wouldn't read any differently from the surrounding rock there. Um... So yeah, it just happened to be that these bones in particular were not radioactive at all. So it's by no means a uh, a universal thing. It's only in very particular specific areas. You know, it might be one one thousandth of all the dinosaur bearing localities in the world are the dinosaur bones actually radioactive to the point where it's detectable. You know? Yeah. This and nope, Defiant Geek, they don't show up with that, no. Came home with a gigantic shoulder blade from an animal that resembled a brachiosaur. Yeah. Nothing so huge had ever been found before. Using models of bones of a brachiosaur scaled up to match the shoulder blade, Jim Jensen built a reconstruction of a foreleg of the animal he calls Ultrasaurus. Yeah. Defiant Geek says, that stinks. I mean, not really. I don't know. We're happy with the way that things are as paleontologists. It's not every problem can be solved by technology. You know? Sometimes it takes good old-fashioned human ingenuity, hard work, and, and, and passion to do things. And that's okay. You know? It's better than okay. That's awesome. You know? Yeah. Random X user says, what's the best place around the Great Lakes to find fossils? You're not going to find any dinosaur fossils around the Great Lakes because any dinosaur-bearing sediments that used to be there were were scraped clean by the, the last Ice Age. But um, give me just a minute here to finish this clip out, and then uh, then we can talk about a really, really cool fossil that you can find in western Michigan, in the northern part around Traverse City. Yeah. Uh, check this out. Its head was high enough to look in at a window on the fifth floor of a building. Yeah. Uh, and Ultrasaurus is not still a valid genus, no. The dinosaurs were supremely successful. Yeah, this was uh, Ultrasaurus, which was had to be renamed Ultrasaurus, because the name Ultrasaurus turned out to be preoccupied at the time of publication and anyway it turns out it's just a big old brachiosaur it's a very very big brachiosaur this is a dinosaurs don't exist no more wasn't it a meteor they're all meteor 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 take it easy the articulate reptile <laughs> and their five raiders are all meat eaters too articulate reptile how are you doing Thank you for that raid. Welcome to Paleontologizing, Articulate Reptile. How are you doing? It's good to have you here. You're the first one to ever trigger that that new alert. Um. Yeah. <laughs> Articulate Reptile, how was your stream? I hope it was wonderful. We were looking at the articulation of a a, a very very large reptile just a moment ago. Here, take a look. The animal he calls Ultrasaurus. Yeah. Aren't you glad you don't have to articulate reptiles this big? Holy moly. Its head was high enough to look in at a window on the fifth floor of a building. Yeah. Good stuff. We don't call it Ultrasaurus anymore. There's a pretty broad consensus that that this very big scapula that um that Jim Jensen Came found home with a gigantic shoulder blade from an animal that resembled a brachiosaur it probably is just a very very large brachiosaurus or something along the brachiosaurus lineage maybe brachiosaurus evolved into this i don't know if we have a great handle on this cartigraphy i one of these days we're going to interview Brian Curtis and we can we can ask him all our giant utah sauropod questions um but yeah, yeah. And Sandella, that was from the surprise. 
the the soprabos. That was from the soprabos. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you might you might have a cold. That's why you that's why you typed it like that. It's this clippage from the soprabos. Um. But yeah, yeah. But no buildings. Are, I know, right? SB. Yeah. Anyway, articulate reptile. Been a wonderful stream. It's it's wonderful to have you here. Um. Let me get another shout out for the articulate reptile. If you like reptiles, if you like osteology, if you like bones, maybe not quite this big, but go follow the articulate reptile right now. You'll see some gorgeous reptile skeletons articulated live on Twitch, put together like a puzzle, but far cooler. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, let's get back to uh, to Dinosaur Fossil Hunter here, because this... We are indeed streaming in that category right now. Wrong button. Man, it's been a long time since I've played a game on stream. Little out of practice. So anyway, Geiger counters like this, they might work on parts of the Colorado Plateau, where you've got lots and lots of, um... of uranium and stuff like that. Ooh. But in this game, you use a Geiger counter, uh, a radiation detector, in order to determine whether or not there is fossil bone in a given rock like this. There's certain things you gotta do in a game to make it more video gamey. And this is what they've done here. And it is, I'll admit, it's an elegant solution. You know? Yeah. Uh, and now we've got to cover that with Plaster of Paris, jacketing like this. Oh, this is so much cleaner and faster than it is in real life. Holy cow. Um, yeah. Now we take this and we put it... I think we put it on a pallet? Is that how this works? I'm trying to remember how this works. I kind of forget. Anyway, I'll just put it there for now. What is this right here? Um... So we can... Throw that! And let's continue to look at spots that we flagged over here. Uh, have I been in contact with the devs? Yeah, a little bit, Sandels. A little bit. They actually promoted this stream today, which was really neat. Um, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, they posted about it on on Twitter. This is a lovely game here. And I, for one, am really grateful that it's hopefully getting more kids interested in dinosaur paleontology. I know for a lot of kids, and a lot of people in general, video games are a way for, for folks to engage with Uh, with different things, whether it's different subject matters to learn about, or whether it's different fields of study and science. Having a paleontology simulator game like this, I think is really lovely. And I'm... I'm really glad that this exists. You know? Oh boy. I'm impressed that I can pick this up. Um, let's, uh, let's inspect this using our magic detector here. And nope. There is nothing there. 
no fossils to speak of. So let's yeet that as far as we can. I'll put it in the shade. There we go. And let's put this one over there too. Yeah, I like that part. I like throwing big stuff. This one looks like it's too big to move. Let's go and inspect our other areas. Let's jump, jump, jump around. All right. Where's my shovel? Shovel's four. There we go. Alright, and now let's use our trusty pick here. Good stuff. Now this, I like how the one that they, they use in here is, it kind of looks more like classic and old-fashioned than a, a modern Estwing geo-paleo pick like this. But it's the same idea, you know? Yeah, let's pick this up. Gently set it down there. That wasn't as gentle as I would have liked, but that's okay. And... And that's telling us that it is... There's nothing important in there. There's our shovel now. Let's keep getting into here. So we do use shovels and picks, of course, while doing what we call overburden. This would actually be an example of what we call overburden right here. Overburden is kind of a self-explanatory phrase. It's when you have to remove all of the surrounding rock that's over where the bone layer is. So you're removing all of this stuff so you can get down to where the actual bone is that you're after. Overburden. You're removing that burden from over the bone layer. And we use picks and shovels to do that. Occasionally, if a crew is really well-funded and close enough to uh, civilization, they'll actually use, like, construction equipment to do that. A backhoe, or a digger, or a bulldozer, or something like that. I've never been on a crew that had access to that kind of equipment. Some folks do, in dinosaur paleontology, on occasion. It's not common. But it happens. Yeah. Um. No one can shame another's bone handling in cyberspace, says Necromanty. I'm glad you're so forgiving, Necromanty. I appreciate that. Let's get rid of this. This thing here. Be gone. And let's let's dig up there with the shovel. There we go. Oh, and what is this here? Let's just scan this here, shall we? Oh, ho, ho. Well, well, well. Uh, this is different from the way that we actually dig fossils, dig dinosaur fossils in real life, and I'll, I'll show you why in a minute. Uh, but first... Use a trowel. I have never once used a trowel in the field as a paleontologist, except to dig a temporary personal latrine. 
When the time comes during the day to heed nature's call, you know, to, uh, as the French would say, uh, to uh, do your poop, sometimes you use a trowel to dig a hole and make a small deposit there, you know? Um, that's the only time I've ever used a trowel in the field. This is very much like an archaeologist tool. But, you know, that's fine. Uh, and then this is plastering a fossil here. Maybe I'll, I'll show you how that works in a few minutes. Um... Forget how this works. How do I? Oh, I've got a, I've got a right click, don't I? There you go. There I go. Okay. Let's look for more of these flags that I've flagged. One more up there. Dig in with the shovel. How fast and smooth this is in the game. Oh man, if only we were like this in real life. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Freelancer says that's such a level up. I know, isn't it? Yeah. I like how we're creating natural arches and hoodoos and stuff like this, too. This is fun. <laughs> Gives the game kind of a more uh, whimsical kind of quality that I do appreciate. Uh, and then we switch to our super pick here. Do some picking, do some picking. Uh, I would not be doing this in real life like this. You're just, like, undermining a big heavy thing by swinging a pick under it, but I don't think you can die in this game, so I'm, you know, I'm just gonna go for it, you know? Some more wish fulfillment here as a paleontologist. Being able to undermine something very heavy in the field and not have to worry about it? I mean, look at that. That's, uh... That's pretty cool, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Look at that. Let's stand directly underneath, huh? Whoa! Didn't even hurt me at all. Invincible. <laughs> Seems like you might want to use some of these techniques next time you go out digging in real life, says nothing about. Oh, definitely. Uh oh, what a, where'd it go? Wait, what just happened? Huh? Wait, I, I clicked and it, it just appeared over here? Um, this rock, this rock empty, but how do I move it from here? I can't destroy it with the pick. It's just going to be here on top of my pallet. How do I get it out of here?
Can we explode it somehow? Hmm. What did I do wrong? Jordy Fish says, Hammer. Ah, uh, yes. Oh man, I wish it were this easy. In real life. <laughs> um. Let's look at this little guy here. Could there be anything interesting in there? And there could be. You know what? There is. <laughs> um. Yep. Nope. Wrong button. Wrong button. There we go. Good stuff. So, this always confused me a little bit about this game. I do like that they incorporate plaster jacketing into this, but that's not actually... Maybe I'll, I'll try and act this out in this game to show you how it works. But creating a plaster jacket in the field happens before we actually extract the fossil. Um, here, let's go find another fossil bone. Then I'll show you how this works. But let's look at this first of all. Let's use our magic fossil finding lawnmower here. Okay, cool. Got a flag there. Got one here. One right there. Ooh. Big one here. Let's just go inspect these ones that are already exposed. Right here. Nothing there. Nothing there. Nothing there. Okay. Let's just do some digging here, maybe. Down, down, down. And let's toss that one as far as we can over there. Good enough for now. I guess this is supposed to be soil or looser matrix that you can remove just with the shovel. And then you've got to use the pick for the more consolidated hardy matrix. Either sandstone or mudstone or something. Can we inspect this yet or do we have to actually get it out of the ground? Okay, we know it's not there. Yeah, Anubis Kaput says, is LiDAR able to help with Dig's dinosite analysis? It 
LiDAR seems to have very, very limited applications. Basically, what LiDAR can be used for at a fossil site is just documenting the... Um, like, what a site looks like after you've been digging there. So if that sort of thing is important, which it often is, then LiDAR can be used for that. Um, but it's essentially like just, it just makes a 3D map of the surface of something. So like, if you use LiDAR at a fossil site, it'll just record the surface of the site. It'll basically make like a digital topographic map of that. And that includes all the tools that you left in the quarry there, you know? Um, it's not always, I don't know, it's not magic, you know? It's not going to give you information in and of itself about about the fossils at the site. It's always something that's going to require interpretation. It's like it's kind of like taking a photograph, you know. Let's eat this one. And uh oh, I'm trapped in a hole now. Oh well. We'll dig our way out. Let's eat this one as well. And let's go this way. If we were at a real fossil site, the amount of digging that you do is always got to be... Got to be real conscientious about that if you're digging on public land. Because chances are you got a permit to be able to do that. We want to be as unobtrusive as possible. We want to be as... Like, to disturb the surrounding environment as little as possible. So it's not like we just go and dig a giant hole somewhere for the sake of digging a giant hole. We try and be very conscientious about that. To disturb the environment as little as possible when we're when we're digging in the field. You know, we're paleontologists, we're not strip miners. Um not saying that's what's going on here. But just in case anybody had that misapprehension that like, oh yeah, we just, you know, dig and dig and dig definitely not how it works. Um, we wouldn't even have the manpower or the time to do that if if we wanted to. It's just not really how it works, you know? be here. Well, well, well. The game says it's something important. Yeah. Let's use our pick. And let's remove some more of this matrix so we can get it loose. And then I'll tell you how we actually use plaster in the field. So in this, we just knocked it loose with a pick and a shovel. That's not how you actually dig dinosaur fossils in real life. Um, clean up the mud, inspect the rock, then jacket it, says Jody Fish. Um, I mean, this works too, but that's very much not how it works in, in real life. Here, let me... Let me show you for a second here. Here we go. My name's Laurie, I'm from... Uh, 
after we find a dinosaur fossil, we dig around it in order to expose as much of it as we can. Um, here is uh, Jim Kirkland and Don DeBlue and their volunteer crew. Um, a number of years before I started working with them. But this is actually the same site that I was digging at this past summer in Utah, just at a higher level. It turns out there's dinosaurs in multiple levels at this site from multiple different faunas, which is really interesting. Take a look. And uh, I'm from Houston, Texas. And I, I came out here, my professor uh, emailed Jim and wanted to know if he had any opportunities for students. And There's Jim Kirkland right there, really Utah excited. State I Paleontologist. No what to expect. Yeah. The ropes, like how to plaster the bones and how to dig with a the very funny fall machine. And keep it clean. <laughs> I'm really careful because I just got here. Um, this, it might take a day. And if stuff starts showing up like this bone or these bones. Yeah, we've got a lovely here, bone right here. Uh, trench around it and get um, a deep like section so we can jack it over it and put plaster. So in real life, when we're when we're excavating a dinosaur like this, you remove some of the rock from around it and then you put plaster on the top of it to protect the bone before you even think about taking it out of the rock. Because it's been in there for tens of millions of years. And exposed to the air, it immediately starts falling apart. And so we'll kind of walk you through that process here. And take it out safely, but when you run into bone like this, it's you're going to have to make a wider area. You're going to have to find out if it's connected to something over here. Or... Oops, Kaputz wants to know, theoretically, if we had a way to inspect microscopic stuff faster and more precisely, if we discovered things around the fossil sites, microfossils, that we currently aren't able to see or process, that already happens, oops, kaputs. Yeah, at a site like this, it's important to keep some of the matrix in the in these fossil jackets so that it can be inspected for things like fossil pollen. Pollen grains can be some of the most informative fossils that you can find. But you need to find them under a microscope. We'll return to this in a few minutes, and you'll see what I mean. But, um, but yeah, yeah. And Lawrence says, what kind of degradation? Some form of oxidation, I presume? It's Part of it is that um, these used to have tons and tons of rock on top of them. And once you remove that, you get that kind of, like, um, static rebound, where, like, it no longer has the weight of the rock pushing down on it. And so it can start to deform and just, like, ever so slowly... It just kind of springs up and crumbles. So that's part of it. Part of it is that it can dry out. Part of it is just it's exposed to the atmosphere now. And so parts of it just kind of start to crumble. You know, it's it's exposed to weathering now. And so every evening when we leave the site, if there are any bones that we weren't able to get out that day, we make sure that they are covered up um, because we don't want them totally exposed to the night air. You know, we put pillows on top of them. We put burlap sacks. We put this, we put that, and then we put a tarp over the site just in case it rains and also just to limit its exposure to the air a little bit, you know? But generally, once you get a bone like this exposed, you want to get a, a top jacket on it as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, and Lauren, 1350, I'm sure those are fine. Yeah. So it really yeah. depends. Oh, every day I found bones. And glue, yeah, too. No yeah, so Plaquemines Mustard, one of the first things, often the very first thing that we do when we, uh, when we uncover a fossil bone... Glue is cheap. ...is that, uh... We cover it with glue. So at this fossil site in Wyoming that I was working at back in 2017, Wyoming, Montana, Rudyard, Montana, uh, with Denver Fowler and Liz Friedman. Um, one of the very th first things that we do is to... Uh, uh, 
there's me right there, is to cover these bones with glue. So we use a kind of polyvinyl acetate glue like this. It's it's kind of like wood glue. Wood glue is also a PVA glue, polyvinyl acetate. This one's specifically formu formulated for fossils. So it's it's basically like a kind of plastic glue that is dissolved in acetone, like nail polish remover. And we mix this in the field. The uh, the glue itself. Um, You know, it's these tiny, tiny, tiny plastic beads. Like this. It looks like sand. We take that and we put it into a container and we mix it with a certain amount of acetone, like nail polish remover, and we shake it up and it dissolves in there. And then we, uh, and then we put it onto the bones like this. It also gets onto the surrounding rock a little bit, and that's okay, because it's reversible. But what we're doing is we're stabilizing the bone. This is what we call a, a penetrative stabilizer. So the acetone from this, acetone is, um, whatever the opposite of viscous is. It's very thin, thin liquid. It evaporates really easily. And it also soaks into things really easily. If you get it onto your hands, it'll, it'll soak into your skin really really fast, faster than water will, obviously. And so it, it's like bone basting necromancy. That's a good way to put it. So as it does it, it soaks into the bone, but that acetone is also pulling the, the plastic in with it. So it penetrates the bone itself. And you've got this, these bits of plastic that are in there that are holding the bone together from the inside. They're stabilizing it. They're keeping it from falling apart. So this is what we do. So we use Vinac or Bootvar or um, Acryloid. These are all like different brand names for these kind of penetrant glues like this that we use on fossil bone in order to keep it from crumbling. The opposite of viscous is fluid. It's highly, highly fluid. Thank you, Lenina. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Is fossil glue cheap? It's cheaper than having broken fossils, Ash Rubber, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, that's uh, that's what we do. And these uh, mustard bottles turn out to be the perfect, perfect vessel for this kind of glue. Mustard bottles like those of uh, of Plockman's mustard here in the chat. Yeah. Fairy Foundling says, "What was used, if anything, before PVA?" Oh boy, back in the old days, um, paleontologists used to use, like this is probably prior to the 1960s, they used to use things like shellac and various other glues like that that really kind of stay on the surface. Things that aren't reversible. Things that like, once they're there, they're there. You can't take them off. The beauty of, of this kind of glue is that it's reversible. Because it because it, it dissolves in acetone. If you ever want to undo it, you just put acetone on it. And you can undo it. Because acetone dissolves this kind of plastic, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. So this is that's why we use this kind of glue in the field today. Um, stuff like Vinac, stuff like Bootvar, stuff like Acryloid, or B72, or stabilizing penetrative glues like this. Yeah. And Jondra says to remove super glue from your fingers, use acetone. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. It's also good for removing nail polish. That's why they call it nail polish remover HD. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Yeah. Um. Oh, yeah. And oops, kaputs. Uh, as paleontologists, we have to remove things from the ground in order to keep them from being destroyed. Because usually when we find a dinosaur fossil, it's because it's already there on the surface. The elements have already been working on it, starting to destroy it. We need to dig it out of the ground so it doesn't get destroyed. So it's kind of the opposite of archaeologists in that case, Oops Caboots. Yeah. 
Um, and hopefully we can do things like, you know, like this to, uh, to really preserve those bones. Yeah. Um, anyway, after we've glued them, uh, then we start jacketing them like Big this. Bone. Sometimes it's little, like, chunks over here that aren't really connected to anything, and, um, I haven't found a femur or anything, but, uh, but you find bone a lot once you figure out what it looks like, at least. <laughs> the bone yep. is really fragile when you first find it, so the glue is, um, it's really, like, you drop it on, and when it dries, it um, hardens the plastic inside. Yep. And so it keeps the bone from crumbling, and it makes it safer to work around it. Yep. Yeah. Before the bones are jacketed. And Tone says, oh, the glue I'm thinking of is white when liquid, but dries clear. This, this is always clear, you know? In fact, actually, I've got a funny story about that. My old crew chief, Denver Fowler, was in the field um, with uh, another paleontologist from New Mexico. His name was Bob. Not Bob Harmon. Different Bob. Um, I could say it. It was Bob Sullivan. Um, and so Denver and Bob were out prospecting in New Mexico, looking for titanosaurs and other dinosaurs like that. So they're out prospecting, looking for bits of bone exposed to the surface that are just weathering out. And, um, and Denver was down kind of on the valley floor, I guess, and Bob was way up on this ridge line. And, you know, they're both prospecting along, looking for fossil bone, and then and then Bob starts making a bunch of noise and waving his arms. Oh, 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 oh. And Denver's like, oh boy. Bob found something really good. He must be, look how excited he is. And so he like runs up to him and he's like, Bob, what did you find? And it turns out that um that Bob Sullivan he would always carry a Nalgene bottle with him, full of water for drinking. We drink a lot of water in the field, especially when we're prospecting out in the direct sunlight like that. So he had one Nalgene for water. But he had another Nalgene, an identical one, that he would keep Vinac in. The kind of glue that we've been talking about. Which, again, is clear. Looks like water. So it's like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Everyone goes, oh, but Bob, what did you find? <laughs> no, I, I, I just drank some glue. <laughs> So keep your Vinac in a different vessel than your water. It's good advice. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we use mustard bottles. Yes, indeed, Blackman's mustard. This whole thing with like, oh, keep it in a water bottle and use an eyedropper. I don't do that. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so after we've exposed the fossil bone and after we've covered it with glue like that and let the glue seep in to strengthen it from the inside, then we get on to mapping, which is really, really important. And if they ever make a dinosaur fossil hunter too, this might actually be a neat mechanic, doing some uh, some mapping like this. Collected, they are mapped onto a grid sheet. So yeah. that position and orientation of the bones is documented. Here, Jessica and I use a metal grid. And there you go, the HD, yeah. She uses a plumb bob to mark the ends of the bones so that I can draw them onto the map. Yeah. These maps are then compiled into a single map. And so these are, this is another one of those things where um, a lot of people, when I'm explaining to them, explaining this to them, especially like a Twitch audience, like all of you good folks, you know, on Twitch, everything is about new technology, new games, new, 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 new. Sometimes the old-fashioned stuff works so much better. Like a piece of paper and a graphite pencil. <laughs> um, in order to, to create a map of a field site like this. Um, because we can actually draw, like using this, this very precise method. With this, uh, this beautiful grid like this. And this is custom made with like uh, these aluminum... Uh, like square tubes, and then uh, this is bicycle brake cable right here. So it's very durable. 
um, I think Jim or Don had these custom made and oh, I used these in the field last year. They're, they're brilliant. Um, use that in a plumb bob grid to aid with the mapping. She uses yeah. a plumb bob to mark the ends of the bones so that I can draw them onto the map. And so you end up with a really, really precise map, but it's the sort of thing that requires expertise and, and interpretation from an actual human being in order to create a map like this. Any kind of scanning technology, no matter how advanced, could never make anything 100th as good as this, because the rock and the bone are essentially the same density. And so, like, no matter what kind of sensor you have, it's not going to be able to distinguish like that. It takes a practiced human eye to tell the difference between the rock and the bone. And this is true of so many things in, in dinosaur paleontology. It's like... Technology really... The wingspan of this flying monster would have been about 15 and one half meters. Well, well, well. Oh, yes, salute. An iconic song has been subscribed for 15 months there. What a coincidence, iconic song. Thank you, thank you. For your support. I really appreciate that. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, Radar Tombstone says 3D scanners faster? They're not. And they're more expensive. And we don't have access to them. And we don't have electricity in the field. And they wouldn't work for this kind of thing. Um... So, yeah, yeah. I know a lot of folks, like, don't want to hear this. That, like, like, oh, you know, technology, of course, it can solve all of the world's problems. Sometimes the old-fashioned way just works better in every respect. And that's that's one of those cases here. You know? Um, yeah. And Stretchy McSkin says, so there will never be anything to scan the ground like in the movie Jurassic Park? I'll never say never. But it will it will absolutely not happen in my lifetime. Or probably in the lifetime of the next generation or the generation after that. I don't know. And even if it did, we would not have access to that in paleontology. You gotta realize, in fossil science, we are extraordinarily underfunded most of the time. You know? We don't have electricity in the field, let alone cutting edge scanning technology, you know? We're extremely lucky if we have a refrigerator that runs on propane, you know? I'll sell propane. We are incredibly blessed to just have that. It is like manna from heaven to have to have stuff like ice in the field and we it is such a precious precious thing you know there will be many many other sciences that get all kinds of cool technology before it ever falls in the lap of us paleontologists you know so yeah yeah it's yeah I'll tell you what there you go Angoy <laughs> yeah um HD says, ever since John Hammond died, paleontology funding has dried up. Yeah. If only those... Those pro had not eaten him. Back in the novel. Yeah. We have learned before that paleontologists don't mind warm beer. Warm beer is better than no beer, Ash Rubber. Yeah. Good old, good old vitamin R. Rainier. Yeah. That's a callback. But yeah. Ungoy says, do you ever bring a cooler with a chunk of dry ice to keep as a freezer? Um, no. We do have coolers with regular ice, but we usually can't get a hold of dry ice. No. Um, yeah. And yeah, Brits don't, well, that's a cultural thing, Sloppy Salamander, rather than necessity. They prefer it that way. <laughs> and dry ice is very, it, it will burn on protected skin. Absolutely, Alex Fixon. And, you know, to be honest, in the field, often, much of our skin is unprotected. Um, you know, sometimes we're showing a lot of skin out there, and that's to help keep us cool. You know? 
Um, it's just, it's just how it goes, you know? Yeah. And look, look at all these wonderful jackets that, uh, this is like on the second to last day of the field season, right before we packed up to, we were in the process of packing up to leave, come back to civilization in August of 2023. Yeah. Um, Stretchy McSkin says, best dinosaur stream on Twitch, you need your own TV show. I appreciate that, Stretchy McSkin. Thank you. You're the second person today who said that, and I am flattered. Um, yeah. And Alex Fixon with the fisheries. Interesting, Alex Fixon. Were you working, were you, was your family working on the side of the fisherman or of the fish? You're still here, so presumably it's on the side of the, of the fisherman and, and women, Alex Fixon. Okay, Sarah Thomas says, technically, this is a TV show. Yeah. Yeah. A live, interactive one. Which is pretty cool. Not gonna complain about that. Uh... Oh, a guinea fowl. Very cool cast of Dreamer. Guinea fowl are really neat birds. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. And a wrap there. Present by Dorling Kindersley. Oh, yeah. Hey, I'd... I'd take an offer from DK. I bet. Anyway, back to what we were talking about here with uh, with the actual process of These digging. These maps are then compiled into a single map that can provide valuable information about how the bones were deposited. Yep, that is really, really valuable information. It's important stuff. After a bone is discovered in the rock, the top surface is uncovered. Just There's a femur right there, a big thigh bone. The bone can be seen. The bone is then pedestaled so that a protective plaster jacket can be put around the bone. Yep. Here, a large femur is being... So, yeah, so this is how we actually dig up bones in the field. And this is a... It really is a beautiful representation of that. So here's that femur, and we trench around it like this. And then we put a jacket over the top of it before we even think about getting it out of the ground. Take a look. Ready for jacketing. Layers of damp paper towels are placed... So that... I wish they'd kind of shown this process, but... Imagine somebody putting damp paper towels over the top of this. That's the difference between this shot and this shot. So this shot is the same bone from a different angle, covered with some layers of wet or damp paper towels. Or maybe toilet paper in this case. No, there's paper towels there too. Yeah, paper towels are uh, for any listeners or viewers from the Commonwealth.
like what we, we spent like maybe 500 bucks on supplies i think i think it was less than a thousand for the whole summer for like three weeks of work and that's for food that's for uh all of our supplies everything else it's you know we're talking about other fields like spared no expense <laughs> spared every expense practically hd <laughs> If there are any, if there are any fantastically wealthy people in the chat right now, if you're interested in sponsoring some scientific work, you can't get a better bang for your buck than dinosaur science, honestly. Um, you know, for like ten or twenty thousand dollars, we could do incredible things with that amount of money. You know? Yeah. Let's protect our fossils, because if they're removed, America loses them forever. And Rabbit Sushi, thank you for that tier one sub right there. I really appreciate it. Welcome to the community. Thank you for literally funding scientific outreach and research and fieldwork here on, on Twitch. Um. I can't wait to to take you into the field this summer and show you what it's like to dig up dinosaurs live. And it's only because of recurring subscribers like you, Rabbit Sushi, that any of that is possible. So thank you. Holy cow. There is another member of this community. If you're feeling a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. And thank you, Sculpin, for those hundred bits. Appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sculpin. We're close to a hype train here. Beautiful. Uh, I'm not going to name any names yet, but there is a uh, very generous member of this community who has been talking about uh, funding some of our work in Wyoming this year. And uh, I and my colleagues are extraordinarily excited about that. I wouldn't tell you about that yet, chat, but... Oh, 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 oh. oh boy. Yeah. Um, this funding goes to your own Jurassic Park. Thank you, Rabbit Sushi. <laughs> yeah. And Alex Dixon says, So when John Hammond said he'd fully sponsor Grant's work for three years, what he really meant was, I have a spare $3,000. You can have it. Yeah. He found it in... In his shirt pocket. <laughs> uh, he's like, I don't know if I really want donuts for breakfast tomorrow. I guess I'll just have oatmeal back at the hotel. You can have this. <laughs> More or less, yeah. Yeah. Um, still like to chip in for crowdfunding? We might still do that, do that too, Sloppy Salamander. We're going to figure it out. But yeah. Yeah. Um, solar panels proved last year. Experiment, yeah, Jody Fish. We'll we'll see about that. Yeah, yeah. Probably got a chunky tax write up for it too. Gene Wen. We'll see about that. Um, I don't know much about that right now, but we'll see if we can figure it out. Anyway, let's let's finish out this video and get back to dinosaur fossil hunting. Being ready for jacketing. Layers of damp paper towels are placed over the bone as a separator yeah. to protect. And I still have the same paper. paper. The same solar Strips panels, of Jody Fish. Are soaked in plaster the same of Paris ones. And placed over the bone and rock to form yeah. a jacket. After the plaster has hardened, the pedestal can be undermined and the jacket flipped over. The same process is then used to seal the bottom of the jacket. It is now ready for transport back to the lab where it can be extracted from the rock. Nope, we're done. This thing's done. Ruby, Ruby makes good stuff, Mommy does, yeah. Yeah. So, um, they didn't actually show the flip here when the jacket gets flipped over. But that's also a uh, an important part of it. So anyway, the point that why I'm showing you this in the first place is that we jacket something. We put the plaster of Paris and burlap over it um, before we actually flip it. And I, I can show you a clip from last summer of how this works. We actually did a couple of flips uh live on stream which was a little bit harrowing but we made it work 
here in Wyoming. We did a couple of these. Let's see. Yeah, here we are. It's fine. Like, this is gonna dry on my hands and I'll be okay. And Tactical Sponge, thank you for those five gift subs. That's brilliant. We we're getting us started off right here on Monday. We're uh, one fifteenth of the way. Sponge really wants ukulele with those five sub gift now. subs. Thank you, thank you, Tactical Sponge. I appreciate that. Good stuff. Okay, let's go back to. Yeah. So I'm getting ready to to coat this duckbill dinosaur limb bone. rock and what's bone um took me a good while to really become confident about so, it so dinosaurs became extinct because they no longer knew how to love each other is that correct no it's not correct what are you talking about and i certainly wouldn't want our species to end the same way pisces thank you for the eight months of support we really appreciate that and holy cow salamander five gift subs there beautiful Oh, that's good stuff. Yeah! Thank you, thank you, Sloppy Salamander, for those five gift subs. I really appreciate it. Thank you kindly for that. And we're uh, we're on our way to a level three hype train here. Beautiful. Here, let, let me show you this process kind of sped up uh, yeah, with this yeah. jabroni here. Comes with experience. Who's this guy? Anyway, this is how we apply the separator to the bone. Um... So we've got water in this basin. And you just go like this with a soft brush, and you kind of dab it onto the surface like that. Yeah. And it gets it to stick. Dab, no uh, cap. Other kinds of separator that people use might be foggers, uh, etc. Aluminum foil, which can get expensive. It's a lot pricier than buying lots of paper towel. Um, back in the olden days, they would use a lot of newspaper. Which is actually kind of cool because if you ever find like a and historic dinosaur, and it's therefore likely that we're here today because, by the luck of the draw, dinosaurs who had been dominant over mammals in ordinary times got felled in a mass extinction. You mean why we're here on Twitch, Stephen Jay Gould? I mean, I think everybody's got their own. Story. Oh, you mean in general? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> why we exist? Uh, Namakwalan, thank you so much for the eleven months of support. I appreciate you. Thank you for helping prevent extinction for this channel and for myself, for your generous support. I really appreciate you. Say, 11 months is a long say, time. you know, the Sternbergs or Barnum Brown or something like that. You can often, uh, 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 you can date it based on the dates on the newspaper, which is pretty cool. A lot of crews have gone back and done that, especially up in Canada. Darren Tankey was working on that, trying to relocate some of these old Sternberg and Barnum Brown quarries and had a lot of success using clues like dates in uh, scraps of newspaper that he would find in the in the old quarries there. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, this is part of my take the best notes back then. So one uh, of my live streams kind of need to do some detective work to from figure Wyoming out, last year here. You know which quarry belonged to which which crew and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, that's really important information if you want to figure out, uh, you know, how old these different dinosaurs are and these historical collections like the American Museum of Natural History or the Museum in Ottawa, yeah. then, uh, yeah, you've got to go back and relocate those quarries so you can take Good stuff. Um, I wonder if I can make this bigger. A bit easier to see. Um, 1,000 bits can make a wonderful difference in promoting the appreciation and understanding of fossil science here on Twitch. Ash Rubber, thank you, thank you. Glue money. Well, they say glue is cheap. Um, don't they? Do they say that? Ash Rubber, that, that's going to buy some glue. That is going to buy some glue. Glue is cheap. Uh, there we go. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Ash Rubber, for those thousand bits. I really appreciate it. Holy cow. Um, yeah. HD says, can we get you to wear a plaid shirt? Um, I do not own a plaid shirt, HD. So, um, good luck with that, I guess. Um, yeah. 
maybe if there are some guards wearing plaid shirts and you have to walk up behind them and go, pull and knock them out, and then you press a button and then you're wearing what they were wearing, maybe then I'd wear a plaid shirt, you know? But yeah. Just for this sponsor... HD. Are you making an oblique reference? To a particular paper towel brand right now. Is that what you're doing? Mm. Mm, just for the sponsor? Really? I mean, I guess I can take this as a compliment. Um... Well, hey, ladies. What a nice surprise. I was just doing a little woodwork. Let me ask you something. Have you ever wished your man were a little more rugged? More dependable? Stronger. Yet more caring. Maybe you wish you were more considerate. Or just a little more helpful around the house. I'll bet you have. That's why I'm starting Brawny Academy. This summer, eight men will be sent here by the women in their lives to learn the important things. Like good hygiene. How to be more thoughtful. How to clean up after a delicious home-cooked meal. And everything else they'll need to become better men. Don't feed that alligator milk. What are you doing here? This guy needs needs a lesson in what in in you know the feeding ecology of archosauromorph reptiles. Men. So tune in to see who rises to the challenge. We've got a lot of work to do. Uh, maybe there is a sponsorship opportunity there, but um. Anyway, yeah. Ooh, much better. Yeah. Although I can't see as many messages this way, but yeah. And it is in Twitch night mode, uh, Andy, yeah. All right, let's see here. Yeah, and it cut out for a while. Anyway, um, so after I've got the whole thing... With separator, then I have got the burlap right there. This extraordinarily expensive fabric. Good enough like that. For those of you who are not aware, I'm making a joke. This is some of the cheapest fabric that you can possibly buy. It's incredibly coarse, very oh, loose weave. Some of the paper but it, it provides a lot of tensile strength to the fossil jacket itself. Uh, only the finest burlap, yes. Kings and queens wear this burlap as garments. <laughs> At least a 10 thread count. There you go, Rosan. If that, I don't know. It might be more like five. Thread count of five. <laughs> uh, nothing's cheap in craft stores, HD. What are you talking about? <laughs> Except life is cheap in, in craft stores. There we are. <laughs> Roll up from the finest Idaho potatoes. Doesn't that just look delicious? <laughs> um, Burlap tea. For three big strips like this, we don't want more water than that. Yeah, we called this burlap tea in the field as long as we dare each other to drink it. No one ever did, but it's just a funny thing that you say. Yeah. Let's see. And Phoenix, the archaeologist, um, it doesn't transfer the fossil, or at least... We can't use color rules in archaeology because it can transfer to the artifacts. Interesting, Phoenix. Yeah, we're not that... We don't... We can neither afford to be that that careful, nor does it matter that much in, in paleontology. Yeah, we take what we can get. You know, beggars can't be choosers, as the old phrase goes. Yeah...
And rose sand. I thought that was that, th that was cotton cloth instead of burlap. I've never seen floral designs on burlap. I think rose sand. I rose sand. I think you're right about that. But I think what you're talking about are flower sacks, which are made of cotton. Um. Yeah. Uh, burlap is sackcloth. Yes, cast a dreamer. But I'm pretty sure here. Overlap with laurel pattern. Let's do a Google image search. And these are literally like screen prints on burlap. But, um, cotton sack with floral pattern, we get all of this stuff. It's like feed sacks and flower sacks. Um, yeah, didn't, no worries, Rosanne, no worries, yeah. So, oh man, this is something you could actually wear as clothing. But when I'm talking about burlap, um, it it literally is sackcloth. Like in the in the Bible, you read about you know like mourners who would put ash on their faces and wear sackcloth and and tear it and and cry. You know, th this is what we're talking about. It's incredibly coarse fabric. Um. Yeah, burlap is not the sort of thing you would want on your body. It would be incredibly itchy. It's literally like a hair shirt, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Hessian rather than cotton, says Tone? I don't actually know. Um. Let's look. Yeah, there you go. It is Hessian or jute. Yeah. I never put two and two together. Sorry. Not a mathematician. Two and two together. Thank you, Tone. Yeah. Necromanty says, unless that's what you're into. Oh, we very much are into it for field work. Um, every time you go out to the field to dig up dinosaurs, you've got to get tons of this stuff. Um, because when you're making a fossil jacket like this, Um, my fingers. If you just put straight plaster over something like this, it will crumble and crack, and because it doesn't have that tensile strength, it needs the fibers in the burlap. Trying to break up. Here's Ken right here. Uh, K Chucker here in uh, in Twitch chat. He was here on Friday. So I like to mix mine really thick. I know a lot of people get nervous about that, but. Thickness gives me a lot of extra. Oh, gotcha, Rosanne. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and Linia says that sweet, sweet plastering ASMR. That's the thing, is that I don't know what it was about the microphone and the camera set up here that I used in the field, but it would pick up those sounds like nothing else, even more than human voices. It was just perfectly attuned to the the squishing, squelching, glorping noises of the plaster. You know? And I guess that paper bag that the plaster yeah, came in, too. Man, more. that's loud. It was not nearly that, like, this is really quiet in, in real life, but the microphone just picks it up. That's beautiful. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Appreciate it, Ken. Yep. Good. Uh, yeah. Do you mind screwing that off to the side? Yeah. Thanks. All right. Nice. Mm -hmm. Mixing that up. You can hear it. It's nuts. It's Good not stuff. that loud. There's so much plaster. But... <sighs> We've got some Lordy says these sounds crack me up. I know, right? Start off with our extra long one here. So, we take these strips of burlap... And we soak them in the plaster of Paris. So, you just soak the burlap in the plaster like this to kind of make a, almost like a homemade bandage. He knows what he's doing. And those literally are old coffee bean bags. Yes, indeed, Slumberlusts, yeah. Ethan got hold of these from a coffee shop in Salt Lake City. Uh, HD, you lost me. I have no idea what you're talking about. 
<laughs> there we go. Get rid of a bunch of the drips. And these strings that we call Klingons sometimes because they cling on. Set that over there. Yeah. Uh. So once you start mixing the plaster, it is like, you know, the, the clock is ticking. Oh yeah. So let me make sure this gets on here. Limited time to work with. The strip is gonna go around the side like this. Let me start tamping it down. So we're making... We nice, very nice. Protective field jacket for the bones. Yeah, it is like paper mache, Grim Deviant. Yeah. So yeah. use your hands to basically work it in. Ash Rubber says limited time because of the heat. Uh, yes and no. So this is a, what we call an exothermic reaction. So this produces heat as the plaster. It's a chemical reaction when the plaster begins to set. When it begins to harden, it releases a bunch of heat, and it like. It, it just ramps up and up and up and up and up. And, um, yeah, it, uh, and like once some of it starts to heat up, the rest of it starts to heat up and it, it, it it's a chemical reaction that's happening. As soon as you mix the plaster together, it's like, tick, 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 tick. The, the clock is ticking there. And so you need to get this done quickly before it all hardens. All those nicks and crannies, make sure it's nice and tight. Exothermic, yes, indeed, birds of the on, yeah, yeah. You don't want any air bubbles underneath. You want it to be smooth and tight. Yeah. The uh, back on the Museum of the Rockies crew, everybody always used to say, "Oh, you know, you want it smooth, tight, and sexy." Um, that basically means don't have air bubbles, don't have air pockets underneath. Get it to conform as as smooth and sleek and and tight to the bone itself as you can. Yeah. It already dries plenty quick, Risa Degu, yeah. We do not need to use quick dry. There we go. It, In fact, it usually dries slightly, ever so slightly too fast. All we right, have to really rush good. to get it to work. Yeah. Ideally, I would have had two people working two. on this, Not but... I was kind of doing this as like a one-man show at the time because I'm also streaming simultaneously. Yeah. yeah. It seems you've plastered your hands here as well. I mean, it hands get plaster on them, yeah. But what you never want to do is stick your hands in the leftover plaster and let it set around your hands because it will literally burn your hands off. I remember Denver Fowler used to tell us this horror story from the UK, where he was from, about how this this girl who, as a laugh, she stuck her hands in some plaster that was setting, uh, like in an art class or something like that. So like her hands were just covered by plaster. She like stuck them into this plaster, down in this plaster bucket. And then she's like, oh, it'll be so funny. I'll walk around with my hands in this bucket. And it'll, they'll be entombed inside. And it, it like that, that chemical reaction, the heat that it released, it, lit it cooked her hands inside. And she ended up losing her hands. So, yeah. Yeah. Really horrifying. Um. And maybe it is an urban legend, Slumberless, but it, it got us to... You only want a thin layer of plaster on your hands, because that's not going to burn off your flesh. It's not going to cook your hands inside as it sets, but you, you feel it start to release heat, you know? Yeah. It's also basic, so you can get chemical burns from it. Yeah. Mark Mephistopheles, that does make sense. Yeah. Put this around the side like this. Yeah. Oh, hello, Mini Pie. How are you doing? You want to come say hello? There we go. Oh, we might have another cat trick going on here. Come here, Minnie. Hey. Okay. 
You wanna come say hello before we jump back into Dinosaur Fossil Hunter? There we go, and then smooth it out. Come here. Hey. Oh, you're using the scratching post. Good for you, Mini Pie. Alright. Yeah. Good girl, Mini. Good girl. You wanna come up here? You wanna come make an appearance? Oh, you just Wow, chat, we've got a hat trick. All three hat all three cats. Yeah, we might as well call it a cat trick. First we had Moon Pie. And then Sweetie Pie. And then Mini Pie. Well, 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 Mini Pie. Can we say hello to you on the cat cam? No, we can't. Here, hang on. Let me reset it. There we go. How's that for up close and personal, chat? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Minnie. Good to see you. Yeah. Oh, look at you. Look at you. Yeah. Hello, I'm Sam Neill from Jurassic Park. Let's protect our fossils, because if they're removed, America loses them forever. And Ortsock, thank you for the follow, and welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Mini Pie, hello. <laughs> oh, Mini. Can I get you a treat? How about I brush you a little bit first? You've got all these loose hairs. You seem like you could use some brush. Oh, that's good stuff. Yeah. There we go. There we go, Mini Pie. Yeah. Who is that? Look at all this. My goodness. ASMR. I don't know if the mic is going to pick this up. I've got... This is a very different microphone setup than I have in the field. I've got all kinds of noise gates and stuff. Oh. What are you doing, Minnie? Can I get you a treat? Can I get you a treat? Would you like that? Chat, watch. Watch how she... Watch how she perks up here when I uh, when I get the treat bag. Mini Pie, would you like a treat? Oh, 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 oh look at that! Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Well, well, well. Well, well, well. Chat, don't steal my treat. This is mine. Did you even chew that mini pie? I didn't see you chew that. I think she swallowed that whole chat. Oh boy. Alright, let's do one more. You better chew this one, mini pie. You see this? You better chew this one. I heard, I heard at least one crunch right there. You need to just slow down a bit, Minnie Pie. It was, it was too fast. I don't think you even enjoyed that. You just scarfed it down. You inhaled that, Minnie Pie. You inhaled it. Wow. She lost that, I'm a cool cat, I don't care about anything facade real fast. Oh yeah. Yeah. 
she she can't hide her enthusiasm from us. With the brush bill. You're brushing some more? Are you gonna Okay, you're gonna vamoose. Fair enough, mini pie. I'll see you in a little bit. Well, well, well. All three cats in the same stream. <laughs> A cat trick, as we call it. Like a hat trick. Like three goals in a football match. Not too shabby, right? Yeah. Good stuff. Um. Anyway, let's depart from this. Let's get back to Dinosaur Fossil Hunter here, shall we? Um, cause yeah, the whole- the whole point of jacketing something like this is so you can get the bones safely out of the ground. And, uh... There's way more than three- well... People would get suspicious if it's- suspicious if it's the same three showing up every time. YouTube is being real slow, so let's just get back to Dinosaur Fossil Hunter here. There we are. Uh... Um... We have this right here. So it's odd that you've got like a fossil bone inside of a discrete rock. That's not how it actually works in the field, but, you know, it's a video game. We can't expect it to be 1000% realistic at all times. And that's fine. So begin jacketing procedure, and I like how in this game it only takes about seven seconds. Oh man, the things that I could do if uh, it worked like that in real life. Gently set that down there, and now I gotta dig my way out, I think. Or maybe, maybe I can jump? Can I jump out of the quarry here? I can't, I gotta dig my way out. Daylight. Let's get out of here. Oh, and look, we've uncovered something else in the meantime. We've got more potential fossils there. All right, freedom. Now let's go get our up oh, hang on. We knew only that they vanished. Now we know the dinosaurs ruled the land longer than any creature before them or since. Actual education. How are Actual you doing? Education. Welcome to Paleontologize. Readers want to know more than that. Holy cow, I really appreciate you being here. Hey, hey, hey to you too. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Thank you for joining us. We are in the midst of a very, very rare video game stream currently. We're playing a paleontology simulator called Dinosaur Fossil Hunter. I myself am a paleontologist. And I dig up dinosaur fossils in the field and we're kind of comparing what this is like between the video game and between real life, like I was showing you uh, which we last doing. summer in the field, doing some live streams then, from Wyoming and Utah. We have to add a layer of separator over this. We use paper towel. That's a, uh, a duck-billed dinosaur tibia, or possibly femur right there. Big limb bone from the hind limb of a duck-billed hadrosaur dinosaur. So yeah, yeah. And a rare. Vi this is the first time I'm streaming a video game in like in like a year, maybe a year and a half. I'm Ms. Monkey, but welcome, welcome. Anyway, actual education. How did your stream go? 
hope it was really, really good. Tell me about what you got up to. I'd love to hear about it. And welcome to Paleontologizing. Um, those of you who are new, my name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. When I'm not streaming from the field, like uh, in this video, I am streaming from here in my office. Um, and, uh, and these are 3D prints to whoever was asking. Um, but yeah, a life-size Allosaurus skull 3D print. Pachycephalosaurus, Deinonychus. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, Schrodinger's pen. There you go, Mark Mephistopheles, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we're gonna be doing many more of these live streams from at least two states this summer. I'm possibly as many as three or four. We'll, we'll have to see. But, um... Anyway, actual education. I hope you had a great stream. That sounds much cooler than Farming Simulator. Oh, you're gonna see. It is much cooler than Farming Simulator. Here. Um... Since we've got some cool new folks here, I think this might be a good opportunity to bring forth our old friend previously recorded Danny to talk a little bit about who I am, what in the world a paleontologist is doing here on Twitch, all that good stuff. Give me a one in the chat if you'd like to see a quick welcome video. A different welcome video than we showed earlier. Because I've got at least three. Um... If you're new around here and you'd like to have a brief explanation of what this channel is all about, how in the world a paleontologist arrived on Twitch in the first place, all that good stuff, give me a one in the chat, and that's a lot of ones. Excellent. Well, well, well. Um, and is that true, Gary and Kelsey? I need to get that sound clip as, a, as an alert, huh? Yeah. Anyway, um, actual education, thank you again for the raid. Can we get one more shout-out for actual education there? I hope you had a wonderful stream. And uh, hang on, goodness. He's very he's very eager. I'm going to leave you in the very capable hands of previously recorded Danny for a few minutes here. So uh, previously recorded Danny, take it away. Well, thanks, present day Danny. Well, if you're new here, then uh, welcome to paleontologizing. You might be wondering to yourself, uh, where's the video game? Well, my name's Danny Anduza. And I'm a paleontologist. I don't really do too much in the way of video games, I guess. I work on dinosaurs. But how does a paleontologist end up on Twitch? Well, I'll tell you. It all started when I moved to Montana right out of high school. In my first week there, I started working in the paleo lab at Museum of the Rockies which at the time was probably the greatest dinosaur museum on the planet. If you've ever seen any of the Jurassic Park movies, then you're more familiar with that institution, and with my old boss, than you may realize. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they say the, the guy, Alan Grant, was you. Yes, yeah, well, fortunately he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> it was in that program that Jack Horner built that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist. I learned a lot of that from Jack Horner's last graduate student, this guy, Denver Fowler, who would go on to become curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum in North Dakota. Under Denver, I did nearly a decade's worth of fieldwork, digging at hundreds of sites in the Upper Cretaceous, excavating literally hundreds of dinosaurs. Here's just a few highlights. In 2012, I discovered the world's oldest specimen of Chasmosaurus, hopefully soon to be published as a new species. In 2017, we dug up a brand new ankylosaur. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head, and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. I've also been lucky enough to help collect another very important specimen the world's smallest and youngest Tyrannosaurus rex. And much like my fieldwork, my research is also centered on dinosaurs. Some of that deals with new genera and species, like this guy, Truarchuncus, a bizarre little theropod from the very end of the age of dinosaurs, who was just published in July of 2020. I've got a few studies in the works right now, some of them focusing on dinosaur biogeography, 
and some others on behavioral functional morphology. Basically looking at bizarre features of dinosaur skeletal anatomy and trying to figure out why those features evolved. And one of my current projects involves spinosaurs. But I can't really talk about that until it's closer to publication, so uh, don't ask me about it yet. Anyway, let's get back to how I ended up on Twitch. A couple years ago, things were definitely on the decline in Montana. So I packed up and moved back to the West Coast. And I have been so much happier here. I've also realized that I have very little patience for the soul-deadening bureaucracy within academia. So for the time being, anyway, I've moved my career in a different direction. And lucky for me, it happens to pay a lot better, too. I kind of stumbled my way into a job in early childhood education. I get to make a real difference in kids' lives and help instill a love of nature and a burning curiosity for the world around them. Then coronavirus descended, and the school shut its doors. But I wasn't about to let a global pandemic stop me and my students. We just moved online. One, two, three. I love digging in the dirt with just a pick and brush. Finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I see are rare and ancient things like velociraptors jump or Archaeopteryx's wings and all the kids who want to see them lining up at a home museum. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. Having made the jump to teaching remotely, it was only a short leap from there to Twitch. I started streaming in May of 2020, and it's been tremendously rewarding. Now, it's my belief that any good scientist should also be a public servant. In my opinion, talking to everyday people about your science is one of the most important things a researcher can do. Twitch is kind of an ideal medium for that. This is my passion, and now I get to share it with you. And what could be cooler than that? It's my intention to continue this mission of education by answering your questions, providing good science content, and working to grow this channel. And if you could help out by continuing to watch, or if you can afford it by subscribing, I would be deeply grateful. So, for my regular viewers, thank you for sitting through that again. And uh, for everybody who's new, welcome. We've got a fantastic little community going here, and uh, we'd be really happy if you'd join us. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up and get back into it. So, uh, present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. And of course, thank you even more to Actual Education for that raid. I really appreciate it. It's good to have you here, Actual Education. Thank you for joining us and bringing your viewers. Uh, as Lenina was saying, yeah, that video is a bit old at this point. I'm working on some new ones. But man, so many things have happened since then. Holy cow. Um... I've done a bunch of field work, got Twitch partner, done various media appearances and the TwitchCon science panel, and there is more stuff coming up, so uh, got some exciting things to look forward to here, for certain. Pipchuria wants to know, when does the digging season start? I'm talking to a colleague in Idaho about that depending on what the weather looks like in Idaho in the month of May. If there's snow on the ground, nuts to that. That means we can't dig. If the snow is gone, we can go dig dinosaurs in the potato state. And I'll be live streaming it. We might even do a little fundraiser for that too, to raise a little bit of moolah to be able to fund that kind of work. Um, 
But man, does that money go far in Utah? Holy, er, in, in Idaho, excuse me. Um, yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll see about that. I'm gonna be in Wyoming in June. Uh, June through maybe the beginning of July. Good song. Yeah. And then uh, July to August, going to be in Utah, looks like. Hopefully, it'll be just like last year. I'll be working in the Cedar Mountain Formation, the earliest Cretaceous of, of uh, Utah, from uh, about mid-July through mid-August. Yeah. I didn't know dinosaurs ate, but they, oh, they didn't tip your potatoes hadn't evolved yet, but we'll be talking about that. Yeah. And yeah, Lenina is absolutely right. This community, this community here, paleontologizing, raised over $7,000 for paleontological fieldwork last summer. We would not have had funding at all, basically, to go out to Wyoming and dig up at least two new species of dinosaur there if it weren't for this incredible community. So um, I'm deeply, deeply grateful for that. Yeah. And John Drew says Wyoming is the least populous U.S. state uh, in both total number and square square mile, too? Really? I thought Alaska was by square mileage. But Wyoming definitely is by absolute population, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, the purpose for today's stream is to play some Dinosaur Fossil Hunter. And uh, if any of you are new, like you've just waltzed in recently... Then, um, here, take a look. This is the game that we're playing. This, oh man, it makes me smile. This is a dinosaur paleontology simulator game called Dinosaur Fossil Hunter. Triceratops skull. That's not quite how it works, but that's okay. It's a video game, you know? We've been talking about how cool this game is and how reality often differs. How they kind of simplified things and made them a little bit more flashy and quick as they turned it into a video game. Just to be expected. Yeah. Dinosaur Fossil Hunter. Excellent game. And I'm... My heart swells when I think of all of the young young people who... Maybe this is their first introduction to dinosaur paleontology. And it might lead to them pursuing a career in fossil science in the future. It's a beautiful thought. It really is. This makes fieldwork look easy. Yeah, Raptor, it's true. Fieldwork isn't always easy, but uh, but yeah, yeah. Can you customize the character to look like you? It's not a... You don't really see the character in this, Pendrake. I'll show you. Yeah. Here we go. It is a first-person perspective. Did I get that right? That's a video game term, right? Here, we've got a fossil here in this plaster jacket. Let's carry that out of the quarry. And over to here. So you don't really see your person, you know? It's not a third person. Right? Isn't that the third person shooter is like Star Wars Battlefront? That I, back when I was in, like, uh, middle school, used to play that on the, the PlayStation 2. Holy cow, they're probably on the PlayStation 3 or maybe even PlayStation 4 at this point, you know? Time flies. Um, anywho, very good gamer. Thank you, Dame Karen. You know, what can I say? Ha ha ha. 
Uh. <laughs> uh. What can I say? I'm a, I'm a paleontologist, not a video gamer. But here I am playing a paleontologist video game. And you know what? It's delightful. Check it out. Dinosaur Fossil Hunter. I love a game that's... that celebrates science in the way that this game does. It's... It's pretty cool. It's pretty darn cool. Here, we're... Let's check this one. We can use our magic scanner here. Okay, we know this one's no good, but... There was something down here, wasn't there? Let's dig in. Plus, plus eight shovel, I see, says Pendrake. Sure? I don't know. Good stuff. Still not seeing anything down here. What's going on? Oh, there we go. It's funny how the... Yeah, this is not how it works in real life, but that's okay. It's a video game. Uh-oh, that just fell down there. Well, let's go... investigate it. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Now, in this game, rather than uh, covering things with a fossil jack a, a plaster jacket before you extract them, you extract them first, and then you strike them with a trowel like this. And then... put plaster on it after it's out of the rock. Whatever. That's okay. At least they have the whole plaster part in this, you know? Another game wouldn't have bothered with this kind of thing. I'm probably supposed to bring those in there, aren't I? Oh well. I'm just putting them here for now. You know what? Let's pick them up and let's start putting them in inside our... Uh-oh. Did I get stuck? No. Good. Management station. No, that's not it. I think I do put them over here, don't I? Figure that part out later. We've got more things to dig over here, don't we? Yeah... Alenia says, do they refer to it as a jacket? I'm not sure if they do in this game. Um, I know in the, f like, in Dinosaur Paleontology, of course, we call it a field jacket. I'm not sure if they do in this game. It's, I hope they don't call it a cast, because that is a misnomer to call it a cast. And you, you hear that in, like, news reports and stuff. But it's, you know, it's called a field jacket. Not to be confused. A cast in paleontology is a very different thing. A cast is a molded and cast replica. You know, that's something that you produce in the laboratory. A jacket is something you produce in the field. Hence, field jacket. What could this be? The 
magic sensor says no bone. So it gets eaten. Uh -uh. Okay. Oh, what's that there? Zup? Well, well, well. This is the fastest plaster jacket I have ever seen. There we go. Pick it up and let's walk it back to over here. There's no space to drop that here. Okay. Let's try that. I don't... This is something that I don't remember is how it works with the pallets and everything. Um... If anybody would like to backseat me here at this point, I, uh, I wouldn't be upset about it. Um, yeah. Seahorses Forever says, does this game also simulate accidental fossil damage or just a dig process? Uh, there's a lot more than just a dig process, but I don't think there is accidental fossil damage. I don't think it really, the game lets you damage fossil bones, which... You know, as a wish fulfillment kind of thing, that's kind of nice. You know, I would appreciate living in a world where it's impossible to damage fossil bones. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. Uh, if you got all the pallets loaded, the museum will come pick them up. H. I don't. That's not how it works. No. There are crates for the jackets in the tent, says Grim Deviant. See, I thought so. Oh, do I put them here? Is this how it works? There's no space to drop that here. Oh, you know what I have to do is I have to build a crate first, don't I? That's what I was missing. I gotta go to the truck and get the disassembled crates. Press E to unload disassembled crates to the excavation site. All right. E. Did it work? I don't think it worked. Press E to unload disassembled crates to the excavation sites. E. What am I doing wrong here? Other tools. A generator. Lights. I need... I think it, it needs me to have crates, right? Small crates. Uh, Q, open radial menu. Drone, I do not want to order a drone strike. Um, do I need to go back to the supply depot area? Press E to unload disassembled crates to the excavation site. E. Do I have any crates left? Asks Ash Rubber. I th you know, I'm, I can't say I'm sure about that. Small crates. Dash. It looks like I don't have small crates. What I think I gotta do is go back to... Go back to here. And I should save this.
Let's see. Twitch. March 4th, 2024. And a save. There we go. Good stuff. So I think we have to go back to where we were. And that has got to be an incredibly strong gate there if it did not just completely get run over by this gigantic multi-ton truck. Uh, that's impressive stuff. So I guess I didn't grab enough small crates. I guess that's the issue. Let's go back to the railroad depot. Whoop. There it is. We almost missed our turn off there. Let's back up, kids. And let's make sure we refuel, because this thing is a gas hog. I draw... I literally drive a Toyota Prius in the field. This thing is... It's going through gasoline like it's, uh... Oh, it's not even funny. Um, I forget how we refuel. We're supposed to have some fuel canisters somewhere, right? Well, first of all, let's get our small disassembled crate. Small crates cannot be loaded onto truck. Is it because the truck is backwards? <laughs> Hold on, something's coming. Something's coming out of here. Hang on a minute here. It's a bird, dude. It knows what's good. I'm telling you, I just heard it inside. <laughs> Pep 3R pots and their 24 Raiders also know what's good. Pepper 3R pots? That's, no, that's, that's Pepper pots. Pepper pots, thank you so much for the, uh, the raid there, and welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? What's shaking? Welcome, welcome to the channel. It is, uh, it's really good to have you here. How did your stream go? Pepperpot says, yep, lol. Welcome, welcome. If, uh, if anybody here with Pepperpots is, is here for the first time, let me to introduce myself real quick. Um, my name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, as you might be able to guess looking at my office here. Um, these, of course, are 3D printed replicas of fossils. Yes, indeed. Broken Nephilim. Welcome, welcome. Wrong camera. There we go. <laughs> Real dinosaur fossils, of course. Where do they belong? Uh, that belongs in a museum! Yeah, I've dug up... I can't even tell you how many real dinosaur fossils over the course of my career so far. And they are all safely ensconced within museums right now. Here in my office, we've got these lovely 3D printed replicas that I make myself. Um, some of them actually scanned from the original bones, which is pretty cool. Anyway, and, uh, Broken, thank you for, uh, for being here. Welcome, welcome. Uh, have to bring any dinosaur fans here since we are playing, we were playing Path of Titans. Well, well, well. I hope that was a ton of fun for you. Excellent. As a dinosaur paleontologist, I dig up dinosaurs and study them and publish on them in the scientific literature. And, uh for the first time in like a year and a half, we are playing a dinosaur video game here on Twitch. We're playing some Dinosaur Fossil Hunter. This lovely game right here, which is... I find intensely flattering. As somebody who actually digs up dinosaurs in the field and live streams it, it's so cool that there's a simulator game all about this. It... It makes me really happy. You know, it's...
I think it's just lovely. You know? Um, you didn't seem over impressed? My thinking on this has changed a little bit because I kind of realized, especially this summer when I was out in the field, it's difficult to make a video game about digging dinosaurs and have it be totally authentic but still exciting and fun to play. Your average person out there digging up dinosaurs might get a little bored, you know? It requires a lot of concentration and a lot of painstaking work and a lot of swatting at mosquitoes and dealing with oppressive heat and sleeping on the ground in a tent and stuff like that, you know? So, yeah. I've come around on this game, and I'm, I'm just really glad that it exists. You know? So yeah, here, let's get back into it, shall we? There we go. Um, I was trying to figure out how to back this truck into the depot. It's funny, because this is like so much cleaner and prettier than... Uh-oh. Than usually what it's like in the field, you know? Oh boy. There we go. I was always good at backing up trucks, you know? Press E to pack small, disassembled crates. All right. E. E. Small crates cannot be loaded onto truck. Wait, why not? What's going on? Press E to remove empty crate. Okay. Press E to pack small, disassembled crate. Small crates cannot be loaded onto... Why not? Oh, man. I'm confused by this. Yeah, it's the wrong truck for small crates, says Jody Fish. <sighs> okay. Well, I guess what we got to do here is... Travel. We want to go back to the garage. And luckily we can do that with the, the push of a button. Rather than, you know, driving for hours and hours and hours like it usually goes in the field, you know? Pickup truck for small crates. Well, let's get that. Um, and look, this is O.C. Marsh's old Stegosaurus reconstruction there. Got some lovely dinosaur models here. Tyrannosaurus there. This is nice stuff. I like this. Triceratops. Ooh, an Ornithomimid. Very cool. Who is this? It's like some sort of Dromaeosaur. Yeah, and... Ooh, this looks like it's supposed to be Utah Raptor. Very... Oh, and their names are there. Yeah. Cool. Anyway, um, dinosaurs on Mars. That's an interesting idea. Uh, what we want to do is get back into the field with a different vehicle. We want to go back to here. And I think we want this one. 
Yeah, good stuff, good stuff. Looks like your office is HD. It kind of does, doesn't it? Kind of does a little bit, I suppose. Yeah. You are certainly not wrong. Press any button to start. Here is, where's the any button? There we go, right here. There we go. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Press E to pack small disassembled crates. Well, E. There we go. Looks like that worked. All right. Good stuff. And look. We were able to pack those in there without even opening the back of the truck. That is pretty slick, if you ask me. All right. Let's get in here and let's hit the road. Driving in the field is actually the most dangerous activity. Um, so it's important to do it very carefully. You're right, Murph. I was trying to make a joke there, but it is the most dangerous activity most people do. Um, yeah. I believe we were over here. There we are. Good stuff. Press E to unload disassembled crates to the excavation site. All right. Here we are. Now, you can take these. And I forget exactly what the mechanic is for how this works. Crate pallets. Management station. Is it here, perhaps? Take small empty crate from storage. Yes. Oh, pallet is occupied. Oh, because we... Because we literally put the fossil... The field jackets on top of... There. Okay. We need to undo that now. Put these here. Alright. Now back to our management station. So organized here. Take small empty crate from storage. Uh, yes please. Click. There we go. Lovely. Alright. Press left click to put inside. Yes, please. Oh, lovely. Is that... Is that full now? This crate is full. Okay. Nice. Grab this one. And the crate's full now. Okay. That little one. Will this fit in here? Nope. It's full. Okay. That's funny. This is... Let's let's try some, some dronular magic here. Palette 1. Call drone. 
Oh boy. How's this gonna work? Hold on to your butts. Let's give it a shot. Oh, is that, is that not possible? Hang on. Do we, do we not have that option? These are not... They're not clickable. Oh, we don't... Call drone with empty small... Cr I guess... I guess this is not possible here. Huh, okay. Can I pick up the crates? I can. And I can load them into... Yeah. La Troca. Actually, what I want to do... Is, yeah, here, I can... I can put that there. We can drive it back to the depot, and then I can go get the big truck. We can pick up the rest of those uh, with the big truck there and bring it back to the museum. There we go. All right. Can I put... Oh, wait, no, I can't put small crates in the big truck? That makes sense. Just like how you can't put a small peg in a large hole, it just doesn't work, you know? I guess I gotta drive him back one by one, huh? that to pick up and then I can put them here on this flatbed rail car there that's satisfying nice do I have to keep doing this individually for each one huh. hey! and the pickup will take three small crates well okay well I can get the next two in one they go on the roof don't they forgot about that thank you Jody fish all right, and how am I doing on gas? I'm okay. Not gonna run out. Oh, and I should get some more fossil crates, shouldn't I? Oh, fossil crates, like uh, like Brian Curtis. Well, I need to contact him about an interview sometime soon. Myosaurs always ate their vegetables. And uh, Dr. Nozimo, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It is good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Let me just say, too, I'm a little impressed with how well I'm using the the D A S and W keys for uh, for driving here. This is not something that comes naturally to me. Much better at driving a real field vehicle than using the D W A and S keys. But we're making it work. We are making it work. Alright, we got those disassembled. Let's take these. We got one right there. We've got another one here, and you know what? We, we can uh, 
Got a third crate boxed up. Yeah, so this won't go there, but it... I thought they were supposed to go on the roof. Will they not go on the roof? Oh boy, what's going on here? I think this only might take one at a time. Yeah. Hmm. Wait, hang on. Did I just put one crate into another crate? Can we nest the crates? Is that how this works? Hmm. There doesn't seem to be... Didn't sound good. Press E to close. Maybe it has to be closed before we can put them on the roof. Just guessing here. I do seem to recall you used to be able to put them on the roof, but maybe they've changed that since then. Now the back is open again. Okay. Well, let's go back to where we were. Disassembled crate. Yeah, shoot. Well, I can't really. Here, yeah. Let's let's test that hypothesis, there, Jody Fish. Let's test that hypothesis. Let's pull this crate out, and very gently set it down. Oh shoot. I'm sure it'll be fine. Professional paleontologist, everybody. Empty crate storage is full. Okay, let's try and deal with that. I think we've got to go back to the computer to do this. Because everyone knows that the way that you assemble crates is using a laptop computer. Okay. All right, we've got empty crates here. Let's take some of these and put them into these crates while we're at it. All right, excellent. And it looks like hopefully we've got room for empty crates now. Press E to unload disassembled crates to the excavation area. It worked. Do we have room for additional crates now? Let's let's see. <gasps> well, well, well. See? Yeah. It's working. Okay, can can we do a third one? Maybe we gotta close this first? I don't know, we'll see. Hmm. 
No, it's still just two, it looks like. But at least that's two. You know, we have effectively doubled our... That was weird. Okay. Okay. We've effectively doubled our rate of crate transportation. So, let's hop in. Let's burn some rubber. And maybe some bumpers, too. There we go. That's the view I want. There we are. We've now driven almost half a mile and we've used about a quarter tank of gas. You see, chat, this is why I drive a Prius in the field. So I don't run into these problems. <laughs> um, press E to open. Pick that up. And let's go put it there on the train. Yeah, good stuff. And the train... Okay, good. It can fit more than two, two crates. That's a relief. <laughs> ah, okay. Now I think I use my tablet device here. Management, perhaps? Car driving, messages, map, knowledge, travel. Notifications. How do I end up sending these back to the museum? I forget how to do that. Maybe we gotta go into the train station here and talk to the, the conductor. Let me in. Here. Um. Trying to pick the lock. I don't know if this is going to work. Um, if I can just bust through the glass, I can reach in and open it from the inside, but... Hmm. Are you going to order a drone strike? military. Let's... How do I do this? Um... <laughs> well, Lynn, how are you doing? Science streams, howdy howdy. How, why do I not have chat on? Here, hang on a second. How do I not have chat on... Uh, here, chat box... Copy. I didn't even realize. I, uh... Oh. There we go. Mm, do I want that, though? I guess I do. Nope, hang on. Yeah, there we are. There you are, chat! My goodness, I missed you. There you go. <laughs> yeah, 
Good stuff. Um, I think it's on the train. I want to say it's in the some sort of a menu thing or something like that. Yeah, this is like a railway terminus here. It just ends there. Yeah. Grim Demon says it's in the tablet. Fuel canisters, hub location. Car location, crates location. Empty crate, hire worker. I would think it would be under management. But it doesn't seem to be. Maybe things will just show up. Maybe you don't have to tell the train to go. Maybe you just travel back to the museum and they end up there. Let's try that. There we go. That's it right there. Do you want to send the crates to the museum? Yes, I do. Yeah. Do you want to travel to the museum? Yes, I do. Let's do it. Yeah. Well, well, well. Good stuff. Let's take a look at it. Press the any button to start. There we go. Yeah, nice. All right. I got plus 7338 Windows XP. Very good. Okay. And let's take a look at this fossil jacket here. We're just going to get right into it. I like this cast cutter here. We do actually use these in real life for this kind of thing. Here, let's let's do this a little bit and then I'll I'll show you a clip of um of how we do this in real life. How we remove the field jackets from a fossil in the laboratory. Uh... Oh boy, this is not... <laughs> Where to move the fossils? Let's move them to the fossil prep room. Yeah, AKA Zipwrap Lab. Oh, I guess it's not there. Prep Lab is. Where's our Prep Lab? You know what, let's just grab some more of those jackets and see if we can prep them. Where do they go? Is that it? It says, look back on the wall. They're outside. The crates are outside. Ah, uh, they're like over in the loading dock area or something like that. Where the vehicles are? Are they out in the parking lot? Small crates delivery area. Take the pallet jack, says Jody Fish. Alright. 
Press E to enter a vehicle. Wow. Lift up. Let's try it. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I don't want to damage the door here. So let's get a running start. HD says, waiting for the game to feature when Bureau of Land Management shows up to check your permits. Yeah, I know, right? I didn't just transport one back to the museum, but also where did it go? I'm not sure where it ended up. I feel like they appeared here before. But I'm not totally sure. Let's go look out in the parking lot. your subordinates prefer oh is that right jody fish okay okay well let's go back out to the field then and let's get the rest of those and let's change vehicle to we don't have off-road suv yet so let's go back to grandpa's pickup there we go yeah All right. Um. Press E to open. There we go. We got those in there. I need to close. I think I accidentally removed one, but that's fine, you know? Not a big deal. Alright, should have a right turn coming up real soon here. And there it is, There's our site. This is like easy walking distance. It's so funny that we're driving. But I guess this is the United States, isn't it? People will drive 100 meters to the corner store rather than walk. Not me, but people do that. Um, all right. Okay. Rex the Tyrannosaurus Rex says, Hi Danny, I just got Dinosaur Fossil Hunter and I'm currently playing it. I'm glad, Rex. Excellent. I'm glad you're in... I hope you're enjoying it. I'm sure you are. Good stuff. It looks like we uh, already have full crates there. So now we gotta go in here. And, okay, I see how this works. This is kind of a game of, uh, of 
musical chairs almost. We've got to make space in one place so that we can move one thing to another and etc. You know, like, a big part of this game is just kind of, like, managing your supplies and that sort of thing. Which is not inaccurate. A big part of Dinosaur Field Paleontology is, honestly, managing supplies. So it's kind of neat that they include that in the game here. sprint too. I can put that inside of there. And then these ones are still empty. I believe. And this one will not go on here. Okay. Second trait crate I put in the truck was in. Really, Jody Fish? Shoot. Yeah, you're right. It's not labeled yet. Let's let's maybe move that out of the way so I don't end up running over an empty crate. I do call myself an expert in dinosaur studies. Dex Phantom Hawk. Huh? Which is a long time in paleontology terms. <laughs> You've learned so much here, Dex Vandemach. Thank you for the six months of support. I do appreciate it. Uh, thank you, thank you. Appreciate you. just like swing open like that when you <laughs> sometimes when you stop or turn around there we go yeah In interesting topography at that site you know I tend to do that Ladina <laughs> For sure. Uh... There we go. Okay. Open that up there. Go load these onto the train. There we go. Good stuff. Travel. I do want to send the crates to the museum. Good stuff. And let's travel to that museum. And let's get some of those jackets opened up, and then we can talk a little bit about fossil prep as well. Yeah. What if you're in a gas called AAA? Um, sure. Yeah. There's nothing else to do but call anti-aircraft artillery and, um, you know, cut your losses, you know? Yeah. Uh, and here we are back at the museum.
Where's our crates? Where'd they go? Oh, hang on. Okay, were these some of the fossils that we uh, we were looking at earlier? We're going to assemble these? Fossil preparation process completed. This looks like a Tyrannosaur hind limb. We've got a tibia right there. We've got a fibula that goes right next to it. We've got a... This looks like a metatarsal here. There you go. Yeah. Can I, can I turn around at all? I can. Nice. Okay. That's a... Oh, this is a Dromaeosaur hind limb. That's the big digit two claw on our Utah Raptor. We've got our digit... Three claw. We've got some pedal phalanges, toe bones. Good stuff. Digit 2 distal phalanx. Digit 2 proximal phalanx. Digit 2 digit two's only got two phalanges. Digit 3, of course, has three. Digit 4 has four. One, two, three, four. Easy as pie. Good stuff. And digit one, I guess, also has two? I thought it only had one. Hmm. Could be wrong about that. Grab that one right there. And then this is one of the cool things about this game is actually just assembling these dinosaur skeletons like this. And I guess this is supposed to be our calcanium or astragalus right there. Yeah. And we are going to go put this on manually to our Utah Raptor skeletal mount. There we go. Look at this bad boy. Very nice. And there we go. Lovely, lovely. Yeah. Uh, that was the one you sent to the prep lab. Walk around, and also you can rotate. Yeah. Good stuff. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Excellent. Cool stuff. There are more, uh, like new dinosaur specimens to find, and I I want to say that I, I thought I was finding some of the new ones, but maybe I goofed that part up. This feels like it was something that we were digging up earlier. I think we were digging up Utah Raptor at a different site. I want to say I was digging up something new today, and I'd love to be able to figure out where those bones went. That I was digging up earlier. Maybe they're in those crates at the far end? Maybe that's them there? Let's go look. No? I feel like the answers might be in here somewhere. Notifications. Travel. Knowledge. Messages. Organization info. Yeah. Also transportation. Okay. 
Good stuff. Hmm. Knowledge, look at the bones. Okay, let's try that. Fossils management, perhaps. Deliver fossils to prep room. Yeah, let's do that. There we go. That's what we were trying to find. So let's use that cast cutter and open up that jacket. This is much faster than in real life. I can tell you that. All right. <laughs> it's cracking it apart. <laughs> uh, so much faster than, uh, than I'm used to. But again, and what have we got here? That's interesting. We've got some interesting looking elements here. Limb bone there. What is this? We've got some phalanges. Phalanx there. Yeah. Um, let me show you for a minute what, uh, what fossil prep is like in, uh, in reality. Um, here we go. Fossil preparation. Here is Don DeBlue, uh, the assistant state paleontologist for the state of Utah. I was working with him this summer. This is a fossil jacket that he's about to talk so here about. We here we are back at the Utah Geological Survey, um, our labs here in our uh, core research center. Uh, so this is one of the jackets from Doling's Bowl. And as you remember from the parts in the field, we We'll isolate the bones and put a jacket over the top. In this yep. case, there were several bones um, that were so close together that we weren't able to isolate them individually. Um, so we got around as best we could, and then what you're seeing here is the top side from the field. And so we jacketed this in the field, made it into kind of a mushroom. Then we flipped it over and we put the top jacket on. So each one is mapped on the grid and has its own um, distinct number. So this one is Dolings Bowl, Gary's Island, number 69. So we have a log sheet and a map that has this on it. Yep. Now what we're going to do Very is careful records over, kept of everything. So we can cut that top jacket off and then work our way in from um, the bottom side. This is how it works in real life. Now it's just a matter of bringing this back into our lab. and. So that was that same kind of cast cutter that you saw in the game, too. So we can cut that top jacket off. See? And then work our way in. That part. From the bottom yeah. side. Yeah. Now it's just a matter of bringing this back into our lab and an authentic looking game palette. There you go, HD. The yeah. <laughs> so this is the jacket that we just opened up yesterday and so uh, worked the rock down. You can see a few things coming out. So we have big flat bone here. It's probably part of an ischium, which is part of the pelvis. Um, and then here's a vertebra here and a few other little mid mix coming out here. Going yeah. up toward the toes, the claws, and the tips of the toes, with metatarsals. There's going to be one more little one down in here. I haven't got Psyche that Gwana says, do you know this man? So that would make this the Don DeBlue, yeah. yeah. That's what I we call our worked with them for the past two summers. Together. I like stayed at his house last, uh, last July. After the fossils are prepared in the lab, they're ready for scientific study and display. All the fossils collected by the Utah Geologic Survey on public lands... Are placed in the space I can, I can imagine, yeah. 
Here yeah. are some of the bones we have collected from the Cedar Mountain Formation that have been loaned by the Natural History Museum of Utah for exhibit at the John Wesley Powell Museum in Green River, Utah. Yeah, good stuff. Anyway, um, yeah, Don, right here, I can, uh, I can find you a clip of him in the field with us last summer. Or us in the field with him. You know, that's... He's the one getting paid. <laughs> um, let's see... There's Don right there. Oh, Arkansoru. <laughs> there you go, yeah. Let's wait till Don gets close to the camera. Um, yeah, Arkansora. Yeah. Saggy one says, I feel like you know pretty much everyone. It's a small field. You know, there's... Nice cold water. There's uh, not very many of us, to be honest. There we go. We should get Don a little closer to the camera here. Yeah, come on, YouTube. You're so slow. Um, we might be out of range of the. Well, what happened here? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, good stuff. Good now. Okay. It's good now, sorry. I think it just wasn't getting a clear line of sight to the router over there. Oh, okay. But yeah, so I think we got most of that. Oh, most of it. Okay. But thank you, Don, yeah. Anyways, yeah, there's the guy in there. So we're slowly working our way down. Yeah. And uh, it's only, this is really the first day that we're- Right, that we're actually- Back out of me? I did Metazoa yesterday yeah, for today. We'll do two tomorrow. And then, of course, we yeah. this morning. And Saggy wanted, really no, really same watch. Getting our shade tarps a little more. Same stuff, watch, so. right? Let's watch every day. Who was here yesterday saw they were blowing a little bit and maybe not quite as, uh, as substantial looking, <laughs> but now we're... I mean, look at... Anyway, that is, uh... That's Don to Blue. And so uh, work the rock down. You can see a few things coming out. So there's big, flat bone. Anyway, let's get back to Dinosaur Fossil Hunter here. Here we are. So, uh, lab work is, uh, a bit faster in this game than it is in real life. As you can see. And what do we have here? What parts are these of our critter? Or what kind of critter is this? I wonder. We've got some limb elements there. I'm not sure what these are. Or what they're supposed to be. These kind of smaller, stouter things. We'll figure it out. We'll probably have to take a look at the tablet here. In fact, let's do that right now. If I can escape from this for a moment. Ooh, it says we've got more Tyrannosaurus. Oh, and we've got an unknown critter here, too. That could be our brand new animal, which I believe we've actually got a non-dinosaur to talk about. And we might have to pick this up. We will have to pick this up another time. Because I have got some stuff I've got to do this evening actual fossil related stuff but yeah 
Anyway. Micro Tyrannus. See, there you go, HD. <laughs> but yeah. Anyway. I hope you had fun today. I hope you enjoyed Dinosaur Fossil Hunter as much as I did. And I hope you'll tune in sometime soon for some more of this, because we probably will do this soon again. We've got some other exciting stuff going on this week. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking about the etymologies of different dinosaur names on Learn What Your Name Means Day. And we've got Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday free and... We might jump into Dinosaur Fossil Hunter in one of those days. We'll have to see. Um, we've got some exciting stuff coming up next week as well. Anyway, don't go away. Don't go away just yet, chat, because we, in the process of wrapping up here, are going to go right into somebody else, hopefully doing some science here on Twitch. So... Let's see, as we run our credits, who is doing some science here. Let's see. Looks like Moo Hoodles is on. Let's go see what's up with Moo Hoodles, who is doing some science communication currently. Some astrobiology and space news. Yeah. Um. Mahoodles was on the science panel with me at TwitchCon last year, and you're going to like her a lot. If you don't know her yet. If you do, then I'm sure you already like her. Anyway, everybody, thank you so much for another wonderful stream. I hope you had fun today. I hope you learned something. And check out Dinosaur Fossil Hunter if you've not yet done that. It's available on Steam. It's not expensive. It's a good time. I like that game a lot. Anyway, thank you to everybody. His names are showing up here in the, the credits right now. Raiders and moderators. Followers and subscribers. Cheerers and gifters. Thank you for your support, for both myself and for this channel and for the this whole community of, uh, of science on Twitch. I appreciate you a lot, and I'm looking forward to seeing you tomorrow when we discuss the different names, dinosaurs, and what they mean. What names mean in general? It's going to be a good time. Till then, everybody, you take care of yourselves. Let's go say hello to Moo Hoodles, talking about astrobiology news. I'll see you there. Bye bye. Um, they added, it is truly 